Um, my name is Johan Johansson, and I would like to invite you and welcome you to this uh, biotechnology conference, uh, the importance of the relationship between research and industry, the future of innovation. Um, special welcome to our speakers and panelists. The conference is the first event in a series of future of innovation conferences, uh, the, how the ac academia and the industry can create value together, uh, cooperation between Alvatech and the University of Iceland. The, the idea of the conference started a couple of years ago, and thanks to COVID, it was uh, dragged a little bit. This is actually quite good because since then we have, uh, have the Alvatech has come to develop, and also some of the uh, businesses we are and the um, researchers we are going to discuss today. Uh, the idea behind this conference started, um, and the topic was how here in Iceland we can build up a, a biological industry uh, as the four pillar for our economy. Um, Alvotech is, of course, a cornerstone, as you see it here at the campus. It's our belief that here in Iceland, we have a great opportunity to create a new industry by capturing the opportunity which lies in the biotechnology. In order to make this journey successful, um, it's very important that the industry, the uh, science world, like the university, and the financial market works together. We have the example from Sweden and um, how they've been doing for the last decades and with this, this uh, combination of the science community, the uh, industry, the financial parties have worked together in a very successful scale. And here today we have uh, uh, participants from all the sectors in Sweden and they will tell us a story in just a minute. I would like to thank all parties involved, the Allotech, the ASTIC, the Swedish Chamber of Com Commerce, uh, Swedish Iceland Chamber of Commerce, the University of Iceland, and the Icelandic Science Park for making this event possible. Um, special thanks to Eugene and Christine Hjörlers, Dr. Steiner, for planning and making this conference possible. Now I will hand the floor over to Svanhildur Hólm Valsdóttir, Managing Director of the Iceland Chamber of Commerce, who will host this conference. I hope you will find this conference interesting and, and uh, enjoy this afternoon. After this, after this event, around 4 o'clock, uh, Alvotech invites you to a, a meeting in, in Alvotech building, which is just next to this one. Thank you. So, um, it's my pleasure to be with you here today. Um, I would also like to uh, welcome all of you, uh, both present here in the university's main hall, as well as those watching online to this conference on behalf of the University of Iceland, Alvotech, Astic, and the Swedish Icelandic Chamber of Commerce, where we, Johan and I, work together. Um, as you said, the topic today, is the future of innovation, how academia and industry can create value together. And um, we have great belief that this is a, a, an area that we can do great things here in Iceland. And um, we will today focus on the development and production of biologics, as well as the opportunities and benefits that result from academia and industry working closely together. Um, and. As Johan said with us here today, we have world-class scientists and specialists in biopharmaceuticals, financing and policy making. Um, we have a quite packed agenda, and as I know you are all aware of. Um, we will do our best to keep to it and aim to um, bring the conference to a close at 4 p.m. today. Uh, <clears throat> uh, 
afterwards, Albert, I would like to invite the attendees here uh, to visit the company's headquarters for drinks and networking. But um, I would also like to say that we, of course, have been having meetings here in Iceland for quite some time. Um, we have to adhere to restrictions, and we do so. Uh, I'm not, uh, I would maybe not say happily, but we do. But Lars Lanfels, who is going to speak here uh, yeah, today, he's told me that this was the first conference that he was given uh, a speech in, in person, since the pandemic started. That's right, Lars. Yes. So we're just happy to have you here with us and, and all of the other speakers and uh, looking forward to your uh, talk uh, later on. But um, without further ado, um, I would like to invite Jón Atli Benediktsson, Rector of the University of Iceland, to the podium. So the floor is yours. Minister of Innovation and Industry, speakers, panelists, dear guests. It's my pleasure to say a few, few words here at the opening of this symposium on the future and innovation in the field of biopharmaceuticals. Development that is organized in collaboration between the University of Iceland, Alvotec, Aztec, the Swedish Icelandic Chamber of Commerce and the University of Iceland Science Park. This event is the first of a series of symposia that will be held, held here in the main hall, the Ola, as we call it, of the university this academic year. The University of Iceland is a wide-ranging international research university and innovation in the broadest sense is a key aspect of everything we do. Innovation is manifested not only in dynamic research, technological development, patent applications, and startup companies, but also in many other ways across all schools at the university. For example, in the development of new methods to support teaching and learning in books that enrich the spirit, new drugs that alleviate suffering, and more efficient solutions for public services. The development of a science park in the heart of the university campus at Vasmiri, a stone's throw from our key partners at Landspitali University Hospital, represents a major step towards further strengthening innovation. The goal of the science park is to bring together university operations and knowledge-driven enterprises in order to systematically further the combined impact of industry and research institutes, thereby laying the foundations for new export and employment opportunities in Iceland. The Science Park is already home to successful businesses such as the biotechnology companies Decode Genetics and Alvotech, and the video games developer CCP. The latest offshoot at the Science Park is the Broska Business Growth Center, which houses a huge range of innovative enterprises, strong support units for entrepreneurs and startups in the field of finance, travel, art architecture, and design. Decode Genetics, which celebrates 20 its 25th anniversary this year is a world-leading company in its field. Decode focuses on identifying the causes of many of the most serious diseases that afflict humanity, such as cancer, heart disease, and diabetes. Decode Genetics and the University of Iceland have a long and fruitful partnership in research and teaching, sharing staff and research students. Efforts are being made to further strengthen this collaboration. The partnership between the University of Iceland and Alvotec was established in 2018, and Alvotec opened its doors here at the Science Park in 2016. And the aim of the partnership uh, is to promote innovation 
in the field of biotechnology and supporting basic research with an emphasis on educating more research scientists in Iceland. Since then, we have developed interdisciplinary collaboration in teaching and learning, research and innovation, along with Alvotech providing students with internship opportunities. A very important example of this collaboration is a master's program in industrial biotechnology from which the first students graduated this spring. The partnerships with Alvotech and Decode provide examples of opportunities that lie in collaboration between higher education and industry in biotechnology. By working together on research and innovation, we can further strengthen the Icelandic economy, creating exciting opportunities for young people, which bring forth economic bring both economic and social benefits to Iceland. The University of Iceland Science Park is a long way from completion and many more exciting opportunities lie ahead. Work is also underway on developing a framework plan for the entire university campus entitled a Green Edge Campus. A key starting point for the new plan is the nature reserve in Vasmiri, that makes the University of Iceland campus so unique. It is also evident that the campus will have a big part to play in the new plan Borgarlina bus rapid transit system. The university campus will therefore not only be an attractive place to work and study for our staff and students, but also for a diverse group of businesses whose operations depend on university graduates and innovative thinking. The University of Iceland's latest contribution to promoting innovation is our new comprehensive strategy for the period 2021 to 2026, which took effect this summer. It is safe to say that the research, innovation and fruitful dialogue with industry and the wider community are central to our new strategy. And that is also the main theme of this new series of uh, symposia organized by Alvotech and the University of Iceland. I look forward to engaging in further discussions about how the University of Iceland can work with the government and industry to ensure the brightest possible future for Iceland. So thank you very much. Yes, by working together, we can further strengthen the Icelandic economy, said uh, the rector. Thank you. Um, I'm sure our next speaker agrees with that. Uh, that's Thortis Kolbrun Reykjör Gilvadóttir, Minister of Tourism, Industry and Innovation. She was supposed to be campaigning in her own constituency today. We have elections in about two weeks, but instead, I think we could say that she chose to campaign for the future, being with us here today. The floor is yours. Dear guests, nice to see you all and know of the others uh, behind the screen. I welcome the opportunity to be with you here today, addressing the question of how academia and industry can create value together. This is an important topic for me as Minister of Industries and Innovation, and also an important global topic in these times of rapid techno technological change. I would also like to thank the Swedish Icelandic Chamber of Commerce for their contribution to this event and welcome our distinguished guests from Sweden. There are many connections between Sweden and Iceland, as you of course know, but both from a cultural perspective and a business perspective, and thousands of Icelanders have worked and studied in Sweden, not least in the field of medical research and biotech. Our history of biotechnology in Iceland may not be long, but we can be very proud of that story. 
We are proud of the scientists and entrepreneurs who paved the way a few decades ago by introducing new technology and microbiology and chemistry, leading to the ident identification and utilization of enzymes from geothermal bacteria or enzymes processed from the Atlantic cod, just to name a few examples. Some important biotech companies were established here in Iceland 20 to 30 years ago, laying the foundation for further knowledge and skills in this field, a stronger innovative environment and new startup companies. We are also very proud of the ambitious scientists who, gave, uh, who have made important contributions to genetic research through the studies on genetic symptoms in Icelandic families. This research combined with creative minds, um, inventiveness, resilience, and considerable patience laid the foundation for our current strong position and global leadership in analyzing and understanding the human genome. Today, we are proud of the strong international biotech companies operating here in the Science Park in Vasmiri, who in collaboration with local academia play an increasingly important role to our economy and the welfare of our society. The Icelandic government has put a clear focus on paving the way for a knowledge-driven economy. And I am very convinced that we have good opportunities to build further and uh, on our current foundation in the field of biotech. For that to happen, we need ambitious individuals who do not hesitate to break new ground and explore new areas. We need both public and private funding, and we need to understand that it takes a long time to develop new products and services in this field. We need educated scientists, very creative minds, and skills to take our ideas to the next level. We need infrastructure, equipment, and facilities. And importantly, we need efficient knowledge transfer and collaboration between academia and industry. As Minister of Innovation, I have put much emphasis on shaping the governmental support for innovation and to build a strong basis for a knowledge-driven economy here in Iceland. An innovation policy was adapted a few years ago putting innovation firmly at the for forefront of the Icelandic uh, agenda. Our clear mission is to establish an efficient support system for innovation and to create a strong and competitive platform for entrepreneurs and startups from which to grow. In the line with our policy, the governmental funding of research, development and innovation has more than doubled during the term of this government Current estimate is 120% since 2017, and that includes the research fund and EU funding as well. Um, this support is mainly through increased funding, tax refund programs, and incentives for venture capital funds. Our goal is not only to increase financial support, but more importantly, to increase the output and efficiency of the governmental support. By reducing overhead costs, simplifying regulations, encouraging collaboration and knowledge transfer between public and private stakeholders, and supporting international networking and collaboration. With a purpose to reduce the gap between academia and business, a technolo uh, technology transfer office, Ödna Technitorg, was established two years ago. And this summer, a new technical center started operations with the aim to support high-tech collaboration between academia and industries. Iceland's R&D tax incentive scheme is generous by international uh, comparison and public support for business R&D has increased significantly as the share of GDP in recent years. Export revenues from knowledge-based industries have more than doubled since 2013, and these industries are already one of the main pillars of our economy. We are optimistic about the future. And if we play the cards right, Iceland will continue to establish itself as the land of innovation. That, that is where we want to be from today and ahead on. A small, technologically advanced country in the north with important global contribution 
to the exciting field of biotechnology. So dear guests, today we ask the question of how academia and industry can create value together. And I am very convinced that the packed list of excellent seminars on today's agenda will provide valuable answers to that important question. I wish you a very fruitful discussions and a pleasant afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, for taking the time to be with us here today. Um, the Minister said that we need people who will break new ground and explore new areas, which I, I think can easily be said about the next speaker. Um, I would like you to welcome Robert Vesman, founder and chairman of Alvatech. He's also chairman and CEO at Alvagen and chairman of Lotus. He is going to talk about real opportunities for Iceland. And I, I would like to say uh, thank you, Robert, for bringing us together here today as one of the organizers of the conference. And uh, we look forward to hearing you talk about all the opportunities that lie ahead. Yeah, thank you so much. It's, uh, of course, a great pleasure to be here with you today and uh, share some thoughts. I will, of course, talk uh, quite a bit about Alvotech because that's uh, an opportunity uh, in front of us here and how we can use that opportunity to basically continue to build up uh, businesses in Iceland. So um, we have quite a few Swedish colleagues here, which uh, is, uh, of course, a great pleasure to welcome also. Uh, it's quite interesting to um, see how the society between science, universities, uh, investments, private companies and public managed to build up uh, an industry of hundreds of uh, biotech companies in Sweden. Is that correct? And uh, I think uh, Sweden is uh, the third largest company with uh, both listed and non-listed uh, biotech co companies after US and China. So, so it's not without reason you were invited here. You're going to tell us all the secrets, how we can copy and paste that into, into Iceland. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Alvotech. Uh, Alvotech is basically a biosimilar company. We, our plan is to uh, become a leading company in our field in coming years. And uh, what we want to do is to create access, patient access around the world for high quality, lower cost products. So if you look at innovation, which is the branded companies, the brands, as we know them, the big pharma companies, they take uh, 10 years, 12 years to develop a product. It costs 2.5 to $2.6 billion on average to develop a, a product. It's quite risky. It's a uh, success and failures. We, on the other hand, are basically developing biosimilars. We can say that's a generic version of, of uh, the brand. We come to market when uh, the patents are off. It takes us uh, somewhere between seven to nine years to develop a biosimilar and cost us around 100 to 200 million dollars still because we have to go through intensive clinical trials. The obstacles in, uh, in general for the industry, if you look at uh, uh, biology or biotech products uh, in the world, uh, those are the products of the future. We are seeing that around 45% of sales in US are now biotech products because those products are more effective. And uh, the downside is that they cost a lot. In US, some of the product cost $140,000, $50,000 per patient. And this is the reason, even though uh, biotech products are the biggest products in the world, eight out of top 10 leading products in the world are uh, biotech products, very effective. But they are so expensive that there are a lot of uh, patients we cannot afford them. And that's why we come in a play to create access. And uh, today there are not many companies in the world like Alvotech which can offer uh, generic versions of, of those products. And I will tell you the reason why. 
So um, we started back in 2012, was the key to get uh, the best uh, in class team. Many of our executives came from leading uh, pharma companies in the world. Uh, Mark Levick here, the CEO, he was in a lead position with Novartis and, and Sando. Our head of R&D was the head of R&D at Pfizer. And I could uh, name all the rest, but it's a long list. So a lot of value and knowledge, uh, which we basically brought in because there was and is a was no value or knowledge of the value around this industry in Iceland uh, only 10 years ago. Uh, the market is big. The biotech products today are selling for over half a trillion dollars. And it's forecasted that uh, the biosimilars will be in coming years be around 80 billion because of companies like uh, Alvotech. The important thing is that uh, Alvotech is not uh, only a, a production company. We develop everything from the uh, beginning, from cell line uh, to the finished product. We produce everything. And uh, we have signed up marketing partners throughout the world, which I will tell you a bit more about uh, uh, later. So um, how this all started, it started almost 10 years ago. It started out of an idea where uh, the regulatory framework was not even existing in the US, how to register a biosimilar. So we did not even know fully how to develop those products or get them approved. Still, we started. Uh, we knew it would take 10 years to build the facility and develop our key portfolio to get to market. And we would spend around a billion dollars. And the good news is that we have spent most of it and we have spent most of it in Iceland. So, uh, so that's the good part of it. We spent uh, the first year a lot of time of building the R&D platform. We have R&D units in, in Germany, Switzerland, Iceland and US. And uh, we did spend a lot of time of uh, building uh, the production, the supply chain, chain, the laboratories and getting ready to launch our products. Once that was done, we started to uh, find commercial partners and uh, I will save that piece to a bit later. And uh, Alvotech is now uh, getting ready to launch the first product, which should come to market uh, next year. And we should uh, see a lot of benefit uh, from that as a company and uh, as a society. Uh, without boring you with, uh, with too many investors and uh, numbers and names, I still want to uh, highlight that we have with us uh, amazing investors. Uh, Temasek, the sovereign fund of uh, Singapore, which is the leading investors in any pharma company in the world. CVC, one of the biggest equity fund in the world. We have uh, the Struman brothers, which are lead investors in in BioNTech, which uh, developed the vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine. And we have a lot of other investors throughout Asia, Middle East and, and Europe. Um, coming back to the commercial, so now we spend a lot of time of building the portfolio. We have seven products in our pipeline. The first one is coming out. Our production facility is ready to produce. And uh, we are actually building and extending uh, the facility here in in Vasmirin. So we will have a full capacity to cover everything until 2030. So we did spend the uh, last two years a lot on commercial uh, agreements. We want to make sure that when the products are ready to go, that we can launch them in all the key markets in the world. And people have not done that before. So we went to the lead players in every region. And we managed to sign a company like Teva, the biggest one in US. Uh, Yangtze River, which uh, is the top two, top three in, in China. We got Fuji in Japan, uh, Stata in Europe, and uh, Jump in Canada. And we have now covered the Middle East, Latin America, South Africa, Asia. So all the key markets in the world have been covered. The good thing with this uh, is not that uh, we did not only sign up uh, a marketing uh, partnership, those uh, partners paid us and are paying us up to $1.1 billion for being our partners. So it costs to be our friends. So um, they are, of course, participating in their the cost in the risk and participating in the future. So and they are obligated to buy the product from us uh, uh, for the coming at least 10 years. 
So, um, when we are asked uh, about uh, our industry, about Alvotech, uh, how many companies are there? And uh, I would say there are only a handful. And who are they? Again, only a handful. But uh, the two which are very similar to our, our businesses, but uh, started a bit earlier than us, is uh, Samsung Bio and Celtrion. Those companies have been on the market uh, with a pure focus on biosimilars. Of course, there are uh, big pharma companies like Amgen and others which have this as a, a part of the businesses, but the pure play biosimilar companies are only a handful. Um, so coming back to Iceland, so for us it was very important to do this in Iceland. We are not a, a, a global company with manufacturing uh, facilities throughout the world. So we are basically creating the value in Iceland, uh, which means when we ship something from Iceland, it's being paid and is part of our uh, infrastructure in Iceland. So we have been building not only investing here, as I mentioned, uh, around 100 billion, but uh, we have invested, of course, in people, which uh, counts now around 500 people, which are uh, operating our businesses and uh, we will be hiring more. Uh, more importantly, for the society long term, we will be paying uh, enormous taxes here, we believe, isn't it, Mark? So we believe that uh, we should be seeing 13 to 20 billion uh, uh, Icelandic in taxes here annually, which uh, is a strong commitment to the community, we, be, we believe. So um, talking a bit about, uh, again, how we can work together with the university and uh, uh, the society here. Uh, Sweden, we'll talk about that, a lot of uh, success with people working together and creating uh, hundreds of companies. The key is that we are building up our business and knowledge in Iceland. There are very few companies like this uh, globally. Uh, it took a lot of effort to bring in the knowledge. The knowledge is more and more becoming local now with the local team, Icelanders. So we hope and we can encourage more companies to come here because now the knowledge is here. And uh, that is basically what you can take away from, from uh, what we are doing here, like is being done in Sweden with all the biotech companies which have uh, started there, which kind of was uh, seeded by uh, two or three of the big pharma, which then left Sweden, but left behind all the knowledge. And that knowledge was grabbed and they used to build up a new industry. And that is exactly what we are doing in Iceland now. We are building up a new industry, which uh, we believe will be one of the core uh, industry when it comes to uh, uh, foreign currency uh, generation and tax paying long term. So coming back to the university, we, as mentioned, we uh, have been working together on, on building a, a master program with the university. It's very important to uh, have more students coming out, which uh, wants to come to us and are well uh, equipped and uh, trained before they come. We are offering uh, also the uh, students to come and work for us short term, long term, and uh, do all kinds of projects with us. So there is no, both sharing of knowledge between the university and Alvotech and also equipment and facilities. So that is one example how I think we can continue to work together. And then, uh, because the minister is here, I will encourage her to go out and help us to find more companies to come here. The knowledge is here, and uh, we should uh, definitely continue to uh, fuel that. So that, uh, that is uh, what I was going to tell you. And uh, again, very pleased to be here. Very excited about the next step in Alvotech Lives, first uh, product coming to market. And uh, the 10 years are almost over. So uh, very exciting times uh, for ourselves, which uh, will be uh, coming through with the first launch early next year. So thank you. Yes, there are truly exciting times ahead for uh, Alvotech. And, and uh, as Robert Dersma said, uh, we are building a new industry here in Iceland that can easily become 
um, one of the most important pillars of the economy in Iceland. And here I see, walking towards me, a man, I've always wanted to say this, a man that needs no introduction. <laughs> <laughs> this is Kauri Stefansson. Uh, he's played a great part in, in, in this field in Iceland, <laughs> and he wants to get to the podium right now. I was just try, going, trying to thank you. I, was, I had a speech, you know, made it no. for you, you know, <laughs> you know thanking <laughs> you for talking. taking part in, you know, tackling COVID in Iceland and the pandemic and everything. And, but you just take the floor. Yeah. I, I want to begin by, by saying that I'm extremely proud of what Robert has achieved. He has particular skills that are somewhat different from the skills that I bring to bear. It's the difference between the applied, let's call it, and the theoretical. And, and the debate between the applied and the non-applied has gone on in all kinds of fields. And I remember particularly when, uh, when Pablo Neruda and Octavio Paz, the two giants of South American poetry, had, had a collision over, over applied versus non-applied. And uh, and Pablo Neruda was criticizing Octavio Paz for not, not writing poetry to serve the revolution. And um, Octavio Paz answered with one small poem that sounds as follows. Poetry, a bridge between history and truth, is not a means to this or that, it is finding stillness in movement. And indeed, I am so lucky that I I work for a company that was funded in 1996. It's currently owned by, by Andien, that is a fairly large pharmaceutical company. But they have left us alone to uh, work on, on human genetics, human transcriptomics and proteomics, just work on the fundamental science of all of this. And the reason it makes sense is that our role is supposed to be the role of discovery. And when you work on discovery, you never know what you're going to find out. So if you assume that you can figure out what is going to come out of the experiment, what comes out of the experiment is not a discovery, but something else. But anyway, what I want to do is just to demonstrate to you in many ways how very, very abstract topic, abstract subjects of science, can be of practical value. And basically, over the past 20 years or so, there has been a paradigm shift in research into the nature of human disease. We have been shifting from the use of animal models over to study human diversity. And actually, human diversity is the phenomenon that is behind these ideas of precision medicine or personalized medicine. You're going to tailor the medicine not just to the disease, but to the individual who has the disease, to the nature of the patient. And, and a very large part of human diversity lies in the diversity in the sequence of A's, C's, and T's in uh, the human genome. It is not only there because, let's face it, we are all of us just a bunch of DNA molecules in a dynamic equilibrium with our environment. So the environment features into this dramatically, but a lot of the diversity, human diversity, lies in the diversity in the sequence of ACGs and Ts. But it's not just human diversity, it is the diversity in the entire biosphere. Uh, and of course, with the rest of, of the animal kingdom, the rest of the biosphere, is just, not just, the diversity is not just due to diversity in the sequence of ACGs and Ts, it all, is also from rooted in some of the environmental influences that we see when we have these DNA molecules in, in this dynamic equilibrium with the environment. So that if, you, if you think about the pharmaceutical industry that Robert represent, represents so beautifully, you see, I was born in the first half of last century, so I'm not used to this technology. <laughs> But if you think about the fundamental task of the pharmaceutical industry, you have to focus, you have to recognize that all diseases of man can be looked up on as the outliers in human diversity. And the task of the industry that is trying to develop medicines and other methods to treat diseases is first to understand human diversity in the context of the disease and focus 
and then try to affect it. And how do we use data on human diversity? We use it to discover bi a biochemical pathway that is perturbed in a disease. Every disease of man, except perhaps the infectious diseases, are due to a perturbation of important biochemical pathways. And then it is to find the protein in the pathway to target with a drug or a, or a drug candidate to abolish the perturbation, then find biomarkers of disease, then find, find biomarkers of progression and regression of disease. And this is just an example of, of relatively recent medicines that came out of the discovery of, of a, a drug target by using uh, human data, data on human diversity. And so the next question is, how do we do this? How do we go about using data on diversity, human diversity, to make discoveries? We begin with a data set on diversity in the sequence of the human genome, another data set on diversity in phenotypes, and then we look for non-chance association between data points in the two data sets. And we at Decode have, have been working on this for a long time, and this is just a list of, of complex traits or common complex diseases of man, where we have found rare variants in the sequence that affect the risk of the disease. And this is another list of diseases where we have found common variants in the genome that affect the risk of disease. And mind you, this kind of of science, what I would call the modern human genetics, started about 2006, and we have, and this has been called uh, the era of genome associations. And if you think about it, we we are working in a tiny country, 360,000 inhabitants, and when people started to look at what had come out of this era, and there is particularly a study done by Melinda Mills who is a professor of sociology at Oxford University, and she was trying to figure out where did this contribution, where did the contributions come from? And it's declared that the overwhelming majority of the new discoveries coming out of this came from here, from Iceland, from a tiny little biotech company in Iceland. And this is an example of what you can do in a country like this, in spite of the fact that you're only recruiting from 360,000 people, if you have a mission, if you have a, something to work for, you can certainly make a contribution in Iceland. But once you have found a variant in the genome that affects the risk of a disease, you need to bridge the gap between the genome and the clinical phenotype. And one way of doing that is to get data not just on the diversity in the sequence of the genome, also get data on diversity in the amount of RNA, splice forms of RNA, amount of proteins in blood, etc., and bring all of it together uh, in the context of a uh, phenotypic data or data on the clinical picture. So when I'm talking about uh, data on, on human diversity, I'm talking about data on human diversity in this broader definition. It's not just genomics data, transcriptomics data, proteomics data, metabolomics data and the data on diseases, but data on family history, data on education, data on socioeconomic status, etc. Because all of this has enormous impact on your health, has enormous impact on your life expectancy, etc. So since I threatened in the beginning to give you a story on something that is fairly abstract, and when you look at it from distance, it looks like it has no relevance to uh, any industry, least of all the pharmaceutical industry, I'm going to give you a story about the brain. Remember, the brain is the organ of consciousness, and consciousness has two major components. It is alertness that you lose and regain at least once a day, and then it is the content of consciousness, which are thoughts and emotions. And we haven't the faintest idea how the brain thinks, we have the faintest idea how the brain generates emotions, but I'm going to demonstrate to you how the thoughts that you may think are irrelevant to diseases in other organs, how they indeed affect who you are, your body composition, and your risk of all kinds of diseases. And the first thing I want to show you is that when you, when you take all of the variants in the genome that affect the, the, the IQ intellect, all of the variants in the genome that affect the education you obtain, and you generate a polygenic score of it. 
there is a clear correlation, positive correlation, between the polygon score for I2 and polygon score for education and your life expectancy. So how much education you get, how, how clear your thoughts are, has an impact on how long you live. Then if we take a step back and go the other way around, and, and we ask the question, if we take a polygon score for body mass index, and remember body mass in, index is a, is a ratio of your weight versus your height, so the higher your body mass index, the fatter you are, the more obese you are, and when we took a polygon score for body mass index, we could show that the higher your polygon score for body mass index, the more genetically you are likely to become obese, the more difficult time you have with a trail making test, the worse you perform on, on, a, on the test of, of verbal IQ, of performance IQ, of total IQ, and the less education you have. So there is a negative correlation between your genetic propensity for becoming obese uh, and, and uh, your ability to perform on test of cognitive functions. Then if we flip it around and we ask the question, what do polygenic score for various components of, or of uh, various components of cognition have on all kinds of aspects of your health? And keep in mind that if you look at test of cognitive function, you have the general cognitive uh, ability, which we measure with the G, that's G factor. And the reason that the G factor exists is that basically all measures of cognitive function are positively correlated, which means that if you score high on one of them, you're going to score high on others. But if you take out this general factor, the G factor, you end up with two polar opposites. The, the verbal ability and the visual spatial ability that we are measuring here as verbal working memory and visual spatial working memory. And we generated polygeny score for verbal ability, took all of the variants in the genome that affect verbal ability, and we generated the score out of it. We did the same with the visual spatial ability, generated polygeny score, the higher you score on it, the, the better you perform on test of visual spatial ability, and then we looked at the impact that this has on all kinds of measures of human health. And the higher you score, the greater your genetic ability to score well on, on visual spatial tasks, the greater your body mass index, the greater is your probability of becoming obese, the greater is your risk of all kinds of diseases that correlate with obesity, such as heart failure, high blood pressure, osteoarthritis, uh, fatty liver disease, etc., and the lower you score on openness personality scale and openness correlates with, with curiosity and creativity, and the less is your risk of schizophrenia and other psychiatric diseases. The higher, the greater your genetic score, the greater you, the, is your genetic propensity to sol solve verbal tasks, the less is your BMI, the less is your risk of all of the diseases associated with obesity. The higher you score on openness per personality scale, remember that correlates with creativity and, and curiosity, and the greater is your risk of schizophrenia and other psychiatric diseases. So basically, the way in which you think, the way in which you're genetically programmed to solve problems has an impact on your body shape, your body mass, and the risk of all kinds of diseases in, in organs like heart and liver, kidney, uh, you name it. And this is important to know, because in your attempt to contain these diseases, you cannot simply focus on these organs. You have to focus on the way in which the function of your brain has an impact on the way in which this organ work, and the way in which you, you gather all kinds of problems that lead to a disease. So basically, the task at hand here is to take the genome, look at the diversity in the sequence, take the RNA, you're looking at the amount of RNA coming from a gene plus the splice variants, you look at, at proteins, and you look at biochemical pathways, and you look at the phenotype. And, and when we are studying things like this, if we can pick one of these components out, and I'm going to end by giving you one example 
or what we could do when we pulled out the level of proteins in blood and used them to make a prediction, all right? And what we try to predict is what is left of life in the person donating the blood sample. And the reason we could do this is that we had uh, blood samples from about 40,000 Icelanders. We measured the level of 5,000 proteins in the blood. 23,000 of these, these uh, participants in this study gave the blood 15 to 20 years ago. So about 7,000 of them, 7,380 had died when we got finally the protein measurement. And what we decided to do is to use machine learning or one of these artificial intelligence algorithms to look for a combination of proteins with a level that predicts how much you have left of life. And indeed, we could do that. <coughs> and we could find 5% uh, of people between the ages of 60 and 80 who had 88 close to 90% probability of dying within the next five years. And we could find another 5% of people between the ages of 60 and 80 who had virtually no probability of dying within the next five years. What is more, we could take this, we could take this uh, calculator and we could show that the shorter life you were predicted to have, the weaker your hand strength, the worse you performed on test of, of exercise tolerance test, and the worse you performed on test of cognitive function. So this turned out to be a measure of human frailty, all right? So the frailer you are, the more likely is, it is that you're gonna die within a relatively short period of time, and you could argue that this is a extraordinarily complicated and expensive way of belaboring the obvious, and it is. But this is a, a mechanism that you can use. And what is more, we have shown that by, by applying this test on people who went through clinical trial, they actually turned out to be a clinical trial for one of the PCSK9 inhibitors, that is probably the best drug in the world to lower blood lipids, that after 24 weeks on the therapy, those who were on the real drug, were predicted to have substantially longer time left to live than those who were on the placebo. So it is not just an, a curiosity, an Orwellian algorithm. It is an instrument that can be used in clinical development. So basically, the, uh, I insist that the only way, or the best way, to look at the kind of science that goes into figuring out mechanism to contain disease, to figure out how to apply the method to con contain disease, is through the study of human diversity. And, and keep in mind, it is, a, it is crucial to realize that all diseases of man can simply be looked upon as outliers in human diversity. And remember, the disease is caused by the extremes in the function of a biochemical pathway, either by upregulation or downregulation of the pathway. And the task of the industry that is trying to cure us of these diseases or prevent these diseases is to, is to study this, the human diversity in the context of the disease and focus, and then figure out how to affect that particular component of human diversity. And that's all I wanted to say. Thank you, Kaure Stefansson. As always, interesting and thought-provoking. I hope you won't hold it against me if I don't shake hands with you from now on. But, um, okay, this was a deep one, but anyhow. Next up, we have Lars Landfeldt, PhD and senior professor at Uppsala University and member of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. His research in neurogenetics has focused on the molecular uh, causes of and treatment for Alzheimer's disease. He is co-founder and board member of Biartic and also given his first talk in person for almost two years. Welcome to the floor. So, um, 
Thank you for inviting me here, I think all uh, Icelandic hosts and uh, University of Iceland. It's very nice to be here. And uh, I've been now in, on Iceland since Sunday. And during the years, I've met many I Icelandic doctors having at least part of their education in Sweden. And quite often I've tried to uh, recruit them to my team to get them to stay longer in Sweden. And most often I must say, however, it has failed. They returned to Iceland and now I really understand why, having been here some days. So I will tell you about uh, my story uh, and how we have developed uh, a molecule, an antibody now in phase three for uh, treatment of Alzheimer's disease. And uh, uh, Dr. Alt Alzheimer, as the Germans say, he uh, described in 1906 uh, the neuropathology of a patient he had had. Uh, this was a woman she died at the age of already 51 years. She died very young from dementia. And uh, Dr. Alzheimer, he investigated her brain after the death, made an autopsy and described, you could say, three features of that brain. It was what we now call amyloid plaque. And that, do I have a pointer here? Oh, okay. You can see a round uh, formation here. That's a plaque and it contains amyloid beta. And that's something we know since the 1980s. And the small tri black triangles there, it's dead neurons. And th they contain hyperphosphorylated tau, another protein. And then you can see on the brain to the right that a lot of atrophy on the brain. It's quite much lighter, smaller that brain. So these features define Alzheimer's disease. And he made the coupling to the clinical situation for this woman, and that was a really great contribution. And uh, I agree completely with Karen, Carrie Stephenson. Uh, to understand human disease, it's very important to also understand the genetics. I'm a bit more uh, not so broad-minded, have narrowed in on neurodegenerative diseases and all factors, genetic factors, leading uh, to uh, Alzheimer's disease converge on this peptide in the plaques, amyloid beta, and uh, which starts the disease process. And you know, scientists always argue and have different opinions on things, and I think this is very good. And we believe in that amyloid beta, beta amyloid starts the disease, are called Baptists, and the guys that believe that Tao starts this, this is are called Taoist. Um, this debate goes on forever. I think, of course, that we are on, are on the winning side. So, uh, 30 years ago, we found a mutation at the N terminus to the left uh, here. Uh, just outside the amyloid beta sequence. Amyloid beta is a 40 to 42 long peptide, which is cleaved out of a precursor molecule, amyloid beta precursor protein, APP. And this mutation, the Americans named it the Swedish mutation, this makes a much better substrate for the enzyme clearing their beta secretase or base. So with the Swedish mutation, they start to overproduce this peptide and get uh, Alzheimer's disease around 
50, 55 years of age, all individuals with the mutation gets the disease. And um, half a year before our discovery, uh, John Hardy had published something named the London mutation. And that mutation was very difficult to understand at the time because it just overproduced the slightly longer part, peptide, the 42 peptide. And in those days, we could not differ between 42 and 40 peptides. So we didn't understand why. But with the Swedish mutation, it was very clear what happened. Too much A beta leads to Alzheimer's disease. And the Swedish mutation has been widely used in model systems for Alzheimer's disease, especially in transgenic mouse models. The Icelandic mutation published by uh, uh, the DECODE team in uh, 2010 was also very helpful because it's a protective mutation. People with the Icelandic mutation have much less risk to develop Alzheimer's disease. And if you do this in a cell culture model, you can see that there is less cleavage, less A beta produced with the Icelandic mutation. So it fits very well to our theory of the disease. And you can see I've named the Upsala mutation. It's a deletion of six amino acids, very recently published by us last week, actually, in Science Translation of Medicine. Uh, the Arctic fam family is, for, I would say, rather small family, but it's the, not the numbers that counts, it's the, the ideas and the principle here. And when I, we found this fam, uh, family with a mutation from northern Sweden that was the, gave the name, we named it from that, we saw something that I found very interesting. It, the mutation made uh, these individuals much more prone to produce a large precursor uh, that we named protofibers. You can see the difference between the Arctic peptide on top and the wild type. Wild type peptide form both monomers and protofibers, but the Arctic um, is much more prone to form these large soluble aggregates. And I got the idea, and there were other things in, in, in the literature around this that made me suspect that it's not the monomers of A beta that's produced from every cell or the end stage found in the plaques, the fibers that are really toxic and harmful. It's these soluble aggregates in between. And I decided we have to develop an antibody against, against these soluble protofibers. And we made the, such an antibody at my lab at the university with a special uh, ELISA technique called inhibition ELISA, where antibody and antigen are allowed to interact at low concentration in solution, which reflects more nat uh, native situation. And the, the mouse antibody that we isolated uh, is, was called MAB158. So it has low affinity for monomers, and also fairly low affinity for fibers and targets um, amyloid beta protofibers with high binding strength. So the concept is that we should not, we should avoid the monomers, which we all produce from all cells during life, and also the end stage, which is the fibers in the plaques, and target what we think is toxic. So that's the uh, character of the, uh, our antibody. And uh, I wanted to go do this all the way to develop this all the way to treatment. And for this, it was extremely helpful to have a collaborator from the pharmaceutical industry. And that was Per Gjelder Fors, he had been with Carbivitrum and Pharmacia. And we managed to um, 
attract the interest of the Japanese pharmaceutical uh, company ASI. And we had a research uh, collaboration with them for some years in uh, 2007, uh, a license um, agreement. And the idea was to bring the antibody then named BAN2401, uh, uh, which stands for Bioarctic Neuroscience, and we founded the company 24th of January, so nothing else than that. And uh, clinical development started 2010, phase one, and phase two, 2013, and in 2018 we had uh, 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 results from a phase two, two study with quite a number of patients, uh, more than 800. And uh, uh, phase three then started and ex is expected to, we have, uh, will have data uh, in next year, in September. And the data from phase two like, looks like this. Um, uh, we have, we, we can slow disease progression over 18 months. Uh, 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 with uh, outcomes is a composite clinical score. ADAS COG measures con cognition and CDR summer boxes measure function. And uh, to notice here is that uh, the effect starts very early. You can see the effect already at six months and it continues to do. We have very strong effect on amyloid plaques. Uh, so we can today measure plaques in many different ways, but using uh, imaging, we have using a PET camera, you can see, visualize the plaques with the camera. And 93% um, of the patients on the highest dose became amyloid uh, negative on, on the PET camera. So this is striking and dramatic results and actually better than I had hoped for. And uh, the ongoing phase three study that will be ready next six September, and you can should notice that uh, the antibody has now shifted name. It's called Lecanemab. Um, it's a global study with seven, uh, 1,795 patients with Alzheimer's disease, it's, it's actually the same type of Alzheimer's patients as the phase two study. And um, the highest dose, 50% get the highest dose. And that was 10 milliam per kilo every second week. And the other half get placebo. And the primary endpoint is one of these uh, scores, the CD are some of boxes, uh, uh, the functional score, and then there, there is a number of other secondary uh, measures that will, will be uh, investigated. And um, there are also other studies ongoing, even trying to in, uh, investigate even earlier patients and they are called AHEAD 3 to 45 in phase three also. So the A45 study is, um, they have a limited cognitive decline and elevated amyloid in the brain. And the A3 study has, uh, they're normal in cognition and they have intermediate amyloid in the brain. So they are really early. And the hope is, of course, in the future that we can treat patients before they are uh, more or less affected at all. And with the rapid development of biomarkers, I th think this will be possible. And we have seen a dramatic development of biomarkers the last, I would say, 25, 30 years, we, we can measure in the CSF of the lumbar puncture, amyloid beta 42 tau and phosphor tau, which 
helps us a lot in the diagnostic process. As I've mentioned before, we have amyloid PET. However, that's a very expensive investigation. And but what's happening now is that we have now measurements of phosphor tau and also amyloid beta in blood that looks very promising. So I'm, I'm my, my vision and many others' vision are that we in the future with a blood test can um, see who are at risk and then at a certain point start behind, uh, uh, the treatment of the patients. So we, of course we have in this field a lot of competition and uh, uh, we, uh, there are, uh, so Lecanema was developed in my lab at the university and uh, BioArctic, the company I formed with Pergo Elefors, uh, uh, humanized the antibody and we established the collaboration with ASI. And ASI is also collaborating with the BioUN, an, an American company, as uh, these trials are so expensive. And then we have aducanumab, which was developed by the Swiss company Neurimune, and they collaborate with BioVM. And BioVM collaborate with ASI, so it's a bit of a mix here. And then we have uh, gantianumab from Roche and donanumab from Lilly. And I would say that these are the... Um, front line, line antibodies. And um, we have the target oligomerous or protofibrils. Aducanumab tar is targeting fibrils, gantinumab also fibrils, and the Lille antibody, something called pure glue A-beta, which is a truncated form of A-beta. And the, the epitopes are fairly similar, except gantinumab which has an N-terminal epitope and also mid-epitope. So effect on cognition measured by ADAS COG for in our antibody 40% less decline, 47% less decline, aducanumab 27 less decline. Lille has not reported on this and for, sorry, Roche has not reported and Lille has a 32 less decline on cognition. And on uh, function CDR, some box of approximately the same uh, change or, or positive effect, and Lila is not reported. Well, a common uh, side effect when you uh, treat, try to treat patients with antibodies against area uh, against a bit is something called area E. It stands for amyloid related. Uh, imaging abnormality and E stands for edema. So the pa some patients develop an edema, which is um, um, uh, if it's a leakage from the blood vessel into the brain parenchyma. It looks awful on MRI, and um, they. Many times patients are not that affected. Sometimes it can be a bit quite severe. And uh, we have 10% uh, of that side effect in the patients. Aducanumab has 35% of the side effect. Cantinumab uh, 30% and donanumab uh, 27%. So um, if you compare our antibody the, with these other three antibodies, you can see that the clinical effect comes more rapidly. And we have a, a very uh, rapid and profound and dose-dependent clearance of amyloid in the brain. And the tolerability profile is very good, I think you could say. We don't need to titrate. We can give a full dose from first day of treatment. Both the by, by aducanumab and the donanumab, the Lilla antibody, or the gantanumab 
rasen till både need to tight it as they have so, so many side effects. And um, so we think we have the opportunity to be, uh, uh, be the first to prove clinical benefit. And um, how can you do such a, uh, a journey that we have uh, done? We have a Swedish researchers possibility to patent our discoveries called Lärar and Antaget, or Teachers Exemption. So I, we founded the company 2003. We are in Stockholm at the start. We didn't have any employees. We could collaborate with uh, the Uppsala University, mainly my re research team. In 2006, with the first collab collaboration with ASI, we could get our own lab and a few employees. Uh, four years ago, we listed the company on Nasdaq Stockholm at uh, 24 uh, Swedish crowns per share, and uh, it's now six times the money. It's 150 kroner, and uh, we have a strong scientific base this in the company and a unique knowledge and technology for immunotherapy, how to handle aggregating proteins and how to develop this type of antibodies. We're well financed and have a market cap today of uh, 13 billion Swedish crowns. And very important has been the collaborations first with Al uh, on Alzheimer's disease with ASI. We have also a program on Parkinson's disease against alpha synuclein, another aggregating protein with AbbVie. And this has made us well-funded, re really, these collaborations. And we have a, a, a highly uh, skilled CEO coming from AstraZeneca, Gunilla Oswald. We have a very uh, uh, skilled and experienced board of uh, six people, and then uh, Per Gellefors and me. Uh, and Per and I are still majority owners of the company. We have mainly Swedish, Nordic, and a few American uh, investors. Uh, some of you might know that um, uh, Biogen's antibody aducanumab was approved in June this year, and this was a great surprise, at least for me, uh, uh, because the effect of the antibody is fairly limited, and they have a high frequency of this side effect. And But uh, I think it demonstrates um, uh, FDA's willingness to, to help this uh, population of patients. And uh, so, and, uh, in conclusion, I think this makes it much more likely that also our antibody, Lecanumab, will be approved uh, by FDA. So, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Lundfeldt. I think this was an excellent um, example of how the partnership between business and science can improve people's lives. And I wish you all the best. Um, we have ahead of us uh, four more interesting talks where we are going to talk about uh, experience from a serial entrepreneur, uh, what makes young life science companies tick, uh, funding medical development in the stock market, as well as bridging the gap between academy and industry, which is what we are here about today. But first, we are going to take a short break, and I ask you to be back here in 10 minutes. So at 14.35, please. Thank you. seats and hopefully 
Um, taken down by the screens as well. Um, next up we have a man who calls himself a serial entrepreneur. Um, this is Matthias Ullen, PhD. He's a professor at the Royal Institute of Technology, Karlöska Institute and the Technical University of Denmark. He is a program director of the Human Protein Atlas program funded by the Knut and Alice Wallenberg Foundation. Professor Ullen is a co-founder of several biotech companies and a board member of, uh, among others, Atlas Antibodies, Afibody Medical, Novozymes, AS, GAN, Fibio, Therapeutics and Sweet Tree Technologies. And uh, maybe I'd like to add that his research has led to more than 650 publications and 63 citations. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me here. I'm extremely pleased to be here in Iceland. Uh, I've been here many, many times. I think it's one of the most beautiful countries in the world. And the people are very friendly and also very hardworking. And I appreciate that very much. So uh, what I was going to talk to you about today is being in the basic research and applied research. And you heard a little bit about that from Kari Stefansson also. First, a little bit about Swedish economy. We are very much dependent on innovation. Uh, more than 50% of our gross national product comes from export. Uh, and we have a lot of research in the country. 3.7% of the gross national product is actually R&D. It's one of the highest in the world. Uh, what is interesting, if you look uh, between the, the difference between export and import, the trade balance, um, the bio-based products are extremely important for Sweden. So out of the big, uh, the seven largest, four of them are actually bio-based with, of course, number one is paper, but then biotech pharma is number three. <coughs> so a lot of people know about the industrial and machines, and these sort of things from Sweden, but also the bio-based is, of course, extremely important for our welfare. Um, we are therefore dependent on innovation and competitiveness, and this is just one of these, you know, uh, how to rank different regions. And uh, the reason I show this is, of course, that I'm very proud that in this ranking in EU of 268 regions, and Iceland was not part of it, that's why I dare to show it, um, Stockholm was the number one region of all 268 regions in, in, uh, in Europe. Um, we have also been, as said this morning, very good at creating companies out of biotech. Uh, actually, when it comes to unicorns, which is, of course, companies worth more than a billion dollars, we are uh, among uh, the absolute smallest region in the world, in the top 10 regions, actually on fourth place when it comes to unicorns. And many of those are actually in life science. So you can see some of them here. I just listed some. I, of course, listed BioArctic. Uh, also uh, a company that I co-founded, Biotosh, uh, but we also have others. And just recently, Olink was uh, introduced to the NASDAQ in the States with a three billion uh, capital market cap. Uh, also, some of these companies have been sold out of the market back with cash. And just last week, Sobe announced that they have a bid for six billion dollars. Uh, Mida and Wilson has been sold for Mida, I think, for eight billion, and <coughs> GE Healthcare, which has sort of its most of its operation Uppsala, was sold for about twenty billion US dollars a couple of years ago. So there is a lot of value that has been created in the biotech business in Sweden. Um, I've been sort of working in the academic field all my life, uh, and what you can see here is a lot of the focus is actually on basic science, 
making publications, you said 650, it's now 750. You said 65,000 citations, it's now 70,000. Uh, but I'm also the founding director of, of the Science for Life Lab, I come back to that, but also director of the Human Protein Atlas Consortium. The Science for Life Laboratory is an interesting one. Uh, about 10 years ago, the government decided that we wanted to have a data-driven, technology-driven institute in Sweden uh, called Science for Life. And I was the founding director of this institute. We started in 2010, and now we have 1,500 researchers, uh, and more than 2,000 pro projects are run there. So I'm extremely proud of this new institute. I'm also very proud of the Human Protein Atlas. So this is one of the largest uh, research programs in Sweden, uh, more than close to 2,000 man years of, of research. Uh, and just recently we published in Science uh, a sort of a digital booklet where we showed the different key milestones in this project in the last 20 years, which which I've been leading. The, the idea here is to map all the human proteins in cells, tissues, and organs. One of the milestones is a collaboration with an Icelandic company, that is the CCP, where we've done this online, EVE online uh, collaboration, uh, but I don't have time to go through that, but it's been a fantastic collaboration. <coughs> we have launched a lot of data into the Protein Atlas, and you can just see some of the highlights here. These are publications in science, uh, and the flagship one is in uh, the Tissue Atlas that was published in 2015. It has now more than 7,000 citations, and it is actually the, the most cited research publication from Sweden in the last six, seven years. But then this has been followed up by other articles in science, and together now we have a very uh, open access knowledge base about the human proteins. Lately, we have sort of used this to move into precision medicine, just like Karin Stefansson was talking about. Uh, what we're trying to do is to actually look at wellness, diversity, what is going on, especially with the blood proteins. And we're using an Uppsala technology called Olink Explore, but also another technology called Target Proteomics. But I don't have time to go into that. Um, but the Protein Atlas then, we've been working on it for 20 years. It is now one of the most uh, visited biological databases in the world. Um, we now have about 20 citations every day, which is, of course, very nice for a scientist. And 20 uh, patent families from this uh, group. But the reason I want to talk about this today is that we also started nine uh, different uh, biotech companies from this program and are actually running five human clinical trials right now uh, based on the protein atlas. So my experience of innovation is sort of summarized here. 80 patents or patent families. 26 startups actually, which five are publicly traded. But I'm also been member of the board of public companies, both in Sweden, Denmark, Norway, and England, which of course is also very nice going from academia, industry, and then back to academia. Uh, when it comes to licensing, because when you're in university, the sort of standard is to license your patent to companies. 43 of uh, our patents have been licensed to companies. There's been an appallingly bad success rate. Three of them has been commercial. Uh, but one of them, the Map Select Shore, is of course an extreme success with more than 1.5 billion US dollar in export income for Sweden. And I'm sure actually Alvotech is buying quite a lot of this for, for their factories because it's used to purify antibodies. So this is just a summary. This is a sort of self-boosting slide showing the um, startups that I've been involved in. Uh, 20 of those, as you can see with the arrow, comes from the university. 
uh, and um, and five of them are now publicly traded, uh, and again, sort of self-boosting the the market cap for these five companies, which are publicly traded, is more than four billion U.S. dollars. So this actually, I'm very proud that the university can contribute to value like that. So um, in my remaining 10 minutes, I want to give you a, a few case studies, just to give you an idea uh, about these companies. And I will not talk about all of them, but I will talk about some of them, uh, just to give you some flavor of how it is to be an entrepreneur coming from academia. <coughs> the first one is Biotage or Biosequencing. Uh, this was a research project started in my group in 1991, so that's 30 years ago. Uh, we did work for about 10 years to try to improve this technology, trying to do DNA sequencing. And in the end of 90, 90s, together with HealthCap, a venture capital, we started this and we recruited Eugene Steiner as our startup CEO, a fantastic guy, and you will hear from him very soon. Um, we then did some expansion of the company, and then we did this sort of VC kind of route. That is, we got one billion Swedish in by an IPO, or $100 million, and then we started the journey to make this a commercial success. Uh, a lot of acquisitions of companies, uh, and we were able to sell the technology to Roche for the first actually the next generation sequencing instrument, the 454. And then this has gone on. Uh, and actually right now, this is an extremely successful company. Uh, I'm a little bit biased, but it has a market cap of 1.6 uh, billion US dollars. The second company I want to talk about is Atlas Antibodies. It's a little bit different. Here we did not take in any venture capital. It was started by the researchers at my university, 110 of them actually. So this was very much sort of a lot of people coming together. Uh, and this was helped by what you heard from Lars Lannefeld that we have this teacher's exception. We own our invention in the university. So it's very easy then to transfer them into a company. We started this one very much uh, sort of more lean uh, by 10 uh, employees. Uh, and then we started to sell products uh, in 2000, uh, I think it was 2009. And we were profitable more or less from the beginning and we didn't have to take in venture capital. The, then uh, by 2012, we actually were very profitable. We were selling about 98% on export uh, and had about 10 million USD in annual sales. Uh, then this company was more or less sold to an investor in Sweden, Investor, uh, a very big um, company in Sweden. Uh, and the market cap now is around 300 million USD. So it's a very nice journey that also this company has done. Then I want to change to a very different story. Uh, and this is the AO5 diagnostics. Uh, what happened here, of course, is that one and a half year ago, we got this little creepy virus called COVID. Uh, and we had very little preparation for testing in Sweden. I think just like you had here in Iceland. Uh, and we were lucky enough to have contact with a, with a non-profit foundation, the Wallenberg Foundation, and they invested 60 million uh, Swedish crowns to make us set up testing in the university setting at the Karolinska. The problem, of course, were that there were no reagents available. So um, we, we, through our contacts, we were able to get reagents in China, but we had no way to get them to Sweden. Uh, but having then contacts with, uh, the, the, with SAS, for example, we were able to take one of the planes that was standing at Arlanda in Stockholm, send it empty down to China, uh, fill it up with six tons of reagents, fly it back, and then one week later we had this lab set up 
for testing. The problem in, Stock in Sweden is that you need to integrate your IT with the journal systems. And there are 21 regions and 21 different journal systems. Actually, it's more than 100 journal systems. So it's very complicated. But we had all our IT people, software engineers from the Protein Atlas, went into the company and started integrated with the IT in the different regions. And this was then finished in a month. And then actually in the university setting, we were able then to do about 600,000 tests for Sweden. We were actually the largest testing facility in Sweden uh, during the fall of last year. Uh, but then we actually got tired. Uh, to actually do commercial uh, things in the university setting is not very easy. You have to do procurements every time you buy in, uh, and so on. So we, start, we decided then to start up a company in the mid-November last year uh, with founders from the university. So 1st of December, we opened the lab. Uh, and in one month, we hired 100 employees. Um, and which is quite amazing. Uh, the cash flow was this disastrous the first month, of course, because we have to buy new equipment, uh, and then you know you have to then get paid for your test quite much later. But since then, then we have had this company open for seven days a week. We have now done more than a million tests and actually is best in class when it comes to turnaround time, which is very important when you do PCR testing. So um, in summary then, we have done more than one and a half million tests. And the reason we could do this quickly is that we can take all the knowledge of automation, IT, robotics, and so on, and very quickly take that knowledge and put it into a company. Um, Finally, I want to talk a little bit about Scandi Biotherapeutics. This is a very unusual company. It's based on AI, uh, artificial intelligence and metabolic modeling. Uh, and with that, we defined a mixture of four natural products that we explored to improve mitochondrial dysfunction or metabolic dysfunction. F uh, filed a patent uh, and then founded a company around that. Um, then we got in 2018 VC funding, not so much, but enough for us to run clinical trials. And we ran the clinical trials in Turkey, which is very uh, cost effective. Uh, did a phase one in 2019, uh, phase two on, on fat liver disease, uh, ran an Alzheimer's disease, a small phase two in 2020, but then COVID came. Uh, and we decided then, since a lot of the complications in COVID has to do with mitochondria and oxygen levels and so on, we decided to test this also in COVID patients. And very quickly, we set up a phase two and then actually a phase three, which is going to be finished. Well, the first one was finished just a few months ago, and we have a second one being finished uh, in, in a couple of weeks with about 600 patients. So now we're planning for clinical trials using these mixtures. Uh, if we can get VC funding for this, we want to run them now in Europe, which is, of course, very much more expensive. And finally, I just want to, well, this is the results from the COVID. Just to give you a feeling is that you can see the time to symptom free for these patients when you have a drug and the placebo. And the significance here is, of course, almost mind-boggling. So we're very, very happy about this. The, uh, the, the last company I want to talk about is Amelonics. This is again based on research at Corti Ho in the 90s, which we are producing this kind of next generation biologicals called Affibody. We, we started an Affibody company back in those th years. This, the startup CEO was Eugen Steiner again. This company is now 100 employees, and I don't want to talk uh, too much about it right now here. But at the university, we continue then to work uh, with these Affi bodies for, 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 uh, for, for binders to amyloid beta, very much inspired by uh, Lannefeld groups and others. So um, 
We had binders, very, very nice binders, and you can see the structure of them to the right there, uh, back in 2008, and then we have done a second generation and a third generation, uh, and then we decided then to actually form a company in 2018, and then last year we had an agreement with Affibody that we will then do uh, the, uh, the Alzheimer uh, thing in this new company and in, in, the equity, in return for equity. So in 2020, we actually have now the world's largest recombinant binder libraries, uh, and we have binders for beta amyloid, for tau, for uh, uh, alpha synuclein and transferrin receptors and so on. Uh, and the beauty here is that with the Affi body, you can actually make like Lego pieces. So you can have a binder to, for, in, for example, transferring receptor, and then a binder to the uh, beta amyloid, and then a third binder to uh, albumin binding to get a uh, half-life up, and, and in this way get this kind of bi-specific bi or multi-specific uh, therapeutics. So, in summary then, uh, what have I learned from this? The, I think the most important is that there is no magical formula. Each journey is unique, um, uh, but what is, I think, always true is that startup is a roller coaster ride. If you don't have a roller coaster ride, it's not a startup, in my view. Uh, what I try to be in most cases is to be lean as long as possible, to try to save money so you don't have a cash flow problem, and then have venture funding when you have a very clear milestone driven plan. There is the, the founder dilution problem that is that you will be diluted during this journey, so it is important to have realistic business plans. We use soft funding. There is quite a lot of soft funding in Sweden, uh, but it's very important to avoid bureaucratic or, or organizations. Some of these soft money, at least in Sweden, also has to do with a lot of bureaucracy, and I hate that, uh, because of sense of urgency. And I think this is very important, and I can see that in the companies here in Iceland, there is a sense of urgency both in the management and the board, and it's very important for biotech. Also, maybe a little bit controversial, I believe that if you're going to make a lot of money, you should aim to be number one in your niche, uh, because the number one is making money. If it's a small niche, you make small money, but you still make money. If it's a large niche, you make a lot of money. So with that, my 20 minutes has passed. I just want to show you a beautiful picture of our campus at the Karolinska in Stockholm and the Science for Life to the, le to the, to the left, where I'm sort of spending my days. Thank you for having me here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Professor Ulien, I got a pronunciation uh, lecture here from my 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 uh, my friend, Dr. Lars. Um, next up, we have uh, Jutin Steiner. Yes, he's an investor and a life science veteran for more than thirty years. He has led more than a dozen life science companies across various geographies and stages of development, and he is very excited to uh, step into the podium. So. <laughs> Without further ado, the floor is yours. Thank you. So I think we have lost the minister, uh, but I wanted to disagree with her. She said that uh, uh, biotechnology is very young in Iceland, but anybody who has eaten fermented shark knows that <laughs> Biotechnology is an old and proud uh, knowledge in Iceland. And I was also happy to hear Kauri um, say that he was lucky, because I, I believe in luck. We are all very lucky, of course. This guy is probably not so lucky. This one is much luckier. Uh, but this is blind luck. We, we all are winners of this type of lottery. 
and, and that's the most important thing in our life, of course. But it's not so interesting. It's much more interesting uh, to look at the type of luck that occurs when an opportunity meets hard and long uh, preparations. And one of the fathers of biotechnology, Louis Pasteur, actually formulated this when he said that chance favors only the prepared mind. This guy was really lucky, Vasco da Gama. And why, why do I talk about Vasco da Gama here? Uh, I think there is a lesson to be learned, um, again, maybe more for the politicians, maybe more for the panel discussion later. But Vasco da Gama was the, this, the, the uh, explorer who was the first to sail around the southern uh, tip of Africa and open up the spice trade to Europe for Portugal. And Portugal became the main economic motor uh, in the world for several hundred years. So, so why is this interesting? Well, I think that's interesting because Portugal was a small country. It was at the outer edge of what was then the civilized uh, world on the Atlantic. Maybe there's some, uh, you, you can recognize uh, the, the, the ge geography somewhere. And, and so why is this then important? Well, a few decades, um, a couple of decades before Vasco da Gama, there was another person, Henry the Seafarer. Henry the Seafarer was a prince of Portugal, and uh, he was very interested in exploration. So he actually, in modern terms, you could say he founded the technological basis of exploration and, and, and actually ushered in the age, what is called today the age of discovery. So he uh, financed and funded uh, the science, the top science of those days. And what was that? Well, astronomy. And the scientists then created applications. And what is the applications of astronomy? Well, it's navigation. And uh, when you understand navigation, you need maps, cartography. So those were the products that were created out of, of the, uh, uh, the early science, the basic science and the apl applicable, the practical uh, science. Uh, and again, Portugal became one of the richest countries or maybe the richest country in the world based on uh, spices. And as you know, spices are worth their weight in gold. And today we have biotechnology products and the value of biotechnology products is worth much more than their weight in gold. Personally, I have been very lucky too. All of my professional life uh, has been in this period where everything that we've been talking about today, whether it's Lars Lanfeld, Matthias, or Kauri, uh, or, or um, uh, Robert, everything they've been talking about has happened during these years. All these technological uh, developments that have been the basis of what we're doing today have, have occurred since 1980. And, um, and I have had the privilege to work with um, almost two dozen, actually, uh, companies in different uh, roles. And um, uh, I, I'm also happy to be a board member of the Karvinsky Institute at Science Park. So I feel very strongly for what you are trying to create here uh, in, uh, uh, in Reykjavik. And I think there, there's a lot of exchange that it would be valuable to do. Uh, and, and we've all been lucky because there's a lot of things happening, uh, some not so good. The uh, aging population, of course, is maybe not so good, but countries are getting rich and are more willing to pay for health care. And uh, although there's a changing burden of disease, it's a good change from infectious diseases to lifestyle diseases, which we might be able to change. And there's an unprecedented um, amount of innovation that's occurring in all kinds of new uh, areas. So that's really where my story begins. And uh, I think it was Walt Disney who said that uh, uh, if you can do it, you, you can dream about it. 
Uh, and I think it's the other way around. You have to dream first, and then you can do it. And the type of companies that we've been talking about, those are always built on some kind of a dream. And it's an innovation sprung. The companies that I've been working with have been mostly from academic science, but of course, there are other sources of innovation also. But there, there's some kind of genius who has been dreaming about a new solution or a new product. And, and in the beginning, there are no products. Uh, there are no customers, uh, but sometimes there are collaboration partners. Uh, there are no real revenue because there's no product that you can sell. But sometimes there's some kind of an advance on future expectations. Like uh, Losh told us uh, that they got payment from ASI and from Abvi, which finances the work that's going on. What I have found in these companies is always an enormous enthusiasm, competence, and a chronic lack of money. And the challenge is the complexity. The R&D is extremely complex and it's risky. Most things fail, actually. And it's very competitive. If you think you are one in a million in your science, there's always more than a thousand other people around the world that are just as good as you. And uh, in order to run a company, you need to master a lot of very highly specialized skills. Many projects need to run in, uh, in parallel. And, and you need to raise capital, but you also want to keep control of your company. And, and then you need to create and nourish the relationships with, uh, uh, with investors, with customers, and, and with your partners around the world. Because there's never, even if you are a large, com if you are a large country, you never have enough good people in one country. You have to work together internationally. And different sizes of companies, of course, have different advantages. You have the small companies that have an extraordinary level of innovation, uh, enthusiasm, as I said, and they are short decision lines uh, and very few relevant priorities. That's good. But a big company has other types of advantages. You have a functioning infrastructure, everything from actually paying wages to people to patent lawyers. Um, and and uh, the financial control. And uh, big companies are good at focusing on products uh, and they have experienced developers. And I'm coming back to this a little bit because the single most important uh, factors when you, are when you start building is to get very, very good people. Uh, and, and you need different kinds of people. You, you need the brilliant scientists, the innovators, but you also need developers. And I'm going to come back a little bit to the different categories uh, in a company to try to explain how I see their, their um, contribution. You need the deal makers and, of course, some management and not to forget the investors. So this is one of my favorite topics. Uh, I think there's a big difference between innovation and product development. Both are very important. And innovation, that, that's based on single individuals that are important. Individuals that have a, a brain a brain function that is a little bit special. And it's like, you know, uh, in, in the Stone Age, uh, everybody saw stones and bones, but somebody saw a tool, if it was a knife or, or um, a needle. Uh, I don't know if it was a woman or, or a man, but somebody was first to see a stone and, and imagine a tool out of it. And um, these individuals need a platform to work in. So there needs to be education. They have to gain experience and of course, technical skills. So there's not a vacuum. It's not propeller heads that, like we sometimes think, uh, that, that people just create uh, uh, miracles out of nothing. Uh, th th there is an infrastructure that is needed for this uh, innovation. Development, on the other hand, is a planned process. You can foresee this process. It doesn't always work, but you can foresee the different steps in, in a development. Uh, process. There has to be a project plan. It has to be based on market and resource analysis. There have to be specifications. There might be technical specification for temperature and things like that, but it can also be specifications that the government decides. 
quality of a, uh, of a medical drug, for example. And you have to do the project management to lead this. Um, and often the project management actually means problem solving. You move from one problem to the next and try to, to get it out of your uh, way. And innovation, there's no economies of scale there. You, you, um, the big pharmaceutical companies have proven, in my mind, that you can become bigger and bigger in, in, uh, in the company, but that doesn't increase the innovation in the company. On the contrary, small companies have shown that they are much more innovative. So I would say they are diseconomies of scale. And, and the best innovations will come in collaborations when two different scientific groups with different specialities uh, meet and, and in the nexus of their uh, uh, knowledges, there will be the most interesting uh, innovations. Uh, and innovations are created at the cutting edge. It's not better mousetraps. It's a really high end innovations that are most important. And in order to do that, you need access to modern technologies, whether they are DNA sequencers or supercomputers, but you need access to the technology. So you need some critical mass and you need society to encourage technology transfer. So there is no special honor to be a university professor if nothing happens with your discoveries. You want that your discoveries to benefit society in as many ways as possible. So that was innovation. And then product development, that aims to meet market needs. Then you have already figured out what the market needs. Where is the disease? What can I do against this disease, for example? But you also have to think about profitability. Which way will be most profitable? Then you have to think about specifications. Um, whether it's design question, quality, or compliance with authorities and marketing and sales. And then we have the business developers. These are the guys that actually make deals happen. Uh, and I must say, I, I've met maybe a handful of such people, and, and they are very special people. They are also very special people. So they are a little bit of Renaissance people. They... they uh, um, they know science, they understand science, but they are not necessarily the best scientists in the world. Uh, they can be lawyers, but even if they are not lawyers, if they are, if they are scientists, they will understand the legal terms, the legal concepts, patents, and, and, and so on. And they are very good at human psychology. Um, and we can say they are rainmakers. Do you know what rainmakers are? So many, many years ago, when, when uh, in the early days of humans, we were dependent on weather. Uh, all the food, whether we were eating animals or plants, we were depending on weather. And one day, there was no rain. For months and months, there was no rain. And people were starting to starve. So what did they do? They went to, to the shaman, uh, to the rainmaker. And the rainmaker would put on his bear skin, and he would do his dance. And it started to rain. And nobody knows how he did it, but it rained. And that's what the rainmakers are doing for, for, um, uh, for the business of a company. Um, I can skip this. And so finally, I want to also, because every, everybody's, uh, of course, uh, curious about the money questions. Uh, and since I have some background in, in the investing, uh, I, I will take it upon myself to talk a little bit about this. So everybody's interested in valuation of companies. And valuation is really the... Uh, Lars Molinder will talk much more and has much more competence about this. But basically, I would say that valuation is the price that somebody is willing to pay uh, for whatever, for the product or the company or the shares that you are selling. And valuation is an effort to estimate the fair value, but it's not really fair. Valuation can be based on many things. There are real economic factors. There's the interest rates. There's wh whatever. Uh, there's also assumptions, which are not facts. They are assumptions. Market potential, probability of success, the development costs that we are planning, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But last and not least, it's also a matter of sentiment. Sometimes the markets are 
are optimistic. Sometimes they are pessimistic. So the same product, the same company can have different valuations. It's imperfect, it's unfair, and it varies over time. Uh, and going to bed with the investors is really a, a little bit like a marriage because you don't really marry just anybody for the money. There must be chemistry and, and you get a very outspoken partner for a very long time and the company, your baby, will create challenges in, in the relationship. And at the end of the day, money issues are also important. So what can an investor provide for you? Well, of course, money capital and they should be able to provide money in several rounds because probably the money of the first round will not be uh, enough. Uh, but they should also be able to uh, contribute commercial and financial know-how. So you add new knowledge to the company, support for the management. Often they are investors in many different companies so they can help you to create your network, to build up your network. And they should have the will and the power to exploit synergies. If they have contacts in different companies, they should help you to connect and, and to exploit such synergies. And also a good investor will provide legitimacy. A good investor will attract other investors to your company. So, so it's important to choose the investors if possible. And my personal experience, being actually on both sides sometimes, uh, is that before investing, it's a very, very frustrating process. It's difficult to get the attention of the investors because there are so many opportunities for them to invest in. Uh, and and um, everybody knows everybody in the, in the venture capital business. So you should, you should learn your story and you should stick with your story and you should never say bad things about different investors because it, it's going to come back uh, to, to you. And during the vetting process, if you get their attention and, and you actually they start listening to you, you should remember that VCs are very smart. Uh, we are often very, very well educated and we come from different backgrounds. We are well read. We never come to a meeting without having prepared ourselves very, very well. We are experienced. We have probably met other companies in your field and we have listened to how they have defined the problem uh, before we meet you. And they are quite tough negotiators. So, uh, if you are lucky and you get the money and the investments, it's not always a very happy feeling on the evening when after tough negotiation you actually sign the contract with the investors. It's not always you feel that you have made the right decision. But then you should remember that the next day when you're sitting in the same boat, everybody is going to be focused on the value of your, uh, uh, of your company and to create value for your company. And, and investors will contribute their time and their network and they will become very active owners. So after um, a honeymoon period, they will demand uh, information and influence uh, in your company, of course, and that can be good and bad. So my final reflections is basically that uh, well, the destination is unknown. Uh, the road is very unsafe. Getting there is actually half the fun. And uh, there are three important rules I would like to end up with. The first one to Anadi is think of a number and double it. And, and in, in, um, uh, uh, if you make a plan, uh, you will, you, you will plan for too little money. And in the life science area, I would say you probably need to triple or quadruple it. There's a lot of money that's going to be needed. Uh, the next rule is if it's on the table, take it. If somebody is willing to give money to you, uh, and the terms are not too bad, I would hesitate to not accept the money because you never know uh, what will happen. And, uh, I, I can tell you, Lars Molinder and Matthias and I, we were raising money actually for Affibody, one of the companies you were talking about. And uh, after very, very tough negotiation, and we were quite hesitant, we decided to take, at that time, it was 300 million Swedish crowns from investors. Uh, the date was the 1st of September 2001. And 10 days later, there was no more money on the table because you know what happened uh, 10 days later. And the last rule is the golden rule. And that's a very unfortunate rule. But he who has the gold makes the rules. 
Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this uh, very practical aspect and in look to the, the business. Um, we have two more speakers on the agenda and then we have a panel to close with. Um, next up is Lars Molinder, he's a senior advisor at Carnegie Investment Bank in Stockholm. Um, he is always a veteran, also a veteran, investment banking veteran. And um, I see your slides are up, so the floor is yours. Thank you. I'm a veteran because I live longer than I care to remember. <laughs> right, so um, I'm going to talk about the funding medical companies. I've done a lot of funding. <laughs> I mean, like Robert said, there is about 200 listed companies in the Nord in, in Sweden alone, biotech companies. I've been uh, running, uh, I've been heading like, I think it's 30 IPOs. IPOs meaning initial public offerings. That's when you enter the stock market and you collect, hopefully you collect a lot of money to run your business. See if this works. So this is me. Um, my background is a science background, so I've, I'm a master of mechanical engineering and shipbuilding. I uh, was actually graduating during the time where the offshore business was booming, so I went offshore and I had a military background as a diver. Uh, so I joined as a saturation diver in the North Sea, meaning that you work between 100 and 200 meters of water depth. And the reason for telling you this is that it brought me head on into physiology because Diving under, under those circumstances and yet being able to perform a job is magic. So uh, I re really got my interest in, in physiology. Then I joined Oscar Veritas, uh, quality assurance, quality control in Norway, headquarters, three years. Then I turned uh, my career into investing in different stages of medical and biotechnology uh, development. I um, joined the Industry Fund, which is a Swedish industrial development fund. Sat there for seven years, investing in very early stage of biotech uh, and medicine developments. Then I joined Alfred Berg Investment Bank, which later was gobbled up by the Dutch bank in Amro. That's where I met Robert Westman the first time, by the way, when he was still running Actavis. Then I joined Carnegie in uh, 2007, and I was heading up the healthcare activities with investment banking. I'm on the board of Alvogen as a result of one funding I helped uh, Alvogen with, uh, and I was asked to join the board, which is very flattering. It's very good to be here in Iceland, by the way. It has been mentioned by my colleague speakers here. Uh, it's been a wonderful few days also in the uh, being hosted by Jean and uh, Christine here. Uh, we have had wonderful days. It's always nice to be back. I've been here many times before. Uh, these are names of companies that have uh, been responsible for the IPOs during the recent five years. So it's been a very frantic period considering it takes nine to 10, 12 months to, to list a company with all the maturing processes that you have, go, have to go through. Biotic is probably the best transactions I've done in my career. Uh, and we've had good fun also, Lars, uh, touring together, meeting all the investors all over the world. Uh, but the stock price has gone up six times since the IPO, which is, you know, magic. And the company is very well funded. So it's one really positive exception for a biotech company. It's very unusual that the owners also are sitting with such a, such a large ownership uh, after this development. So... Uh, the company does the IPO for the first time. You don't get a second chance to make a first impression. Uh, we do it all the time, we bankers. We provide a whole organization behind us. I mean, there's lots of subactivities going on in the investment bank. Carnegie is the largest investment bank in the Nordic countries. And in fact, we are largest in Europe when it comes to healthcare business, when it comes to number of transactions and volume of transactions even beating the big guys like Morgan Stanley's in this world. And we help uh, the company making the IPO a success. It's so important, like I said, you never get a second shot on goal. Uh, a failure means, you know, that you are uh, probably damaged goods for a long, long period ahead. 
Uh, we give access to international community of investors, which is very important also in order to get a good ownership table in the company so that the stock is trading on a sta in a stable fashion. Uh, and we support the company in all aspects, also in the future. It's a, it's a partnership that we're entering into. It's not a one-off. It's not a smash and grab. We are actually staying friends with the company, close to the companies for a long, long period ahead. And remember, we sell advice, not ours. Sometimes we get asked, you know, what you do for all this money you require to IPO us. And uh, I always tell them the story about the watchmaker, which I stole from my father. There was this guy who had a, a watch he was very fond of, and it was broken. So he goes to the watchmaker and says, can you mend this for me? And the watchmaker says, I'm sure I can. Come back in a week. So the man comes back in a week, and to his joy, the watch was working again. He's delighted and says, how much do I owe you? And the watchmaker says, 100 euros. And the man gets irritated and he says, that's rather careless of you to cough up an amount like that without specifying what you've done. So the watchmaker takes out a piece of paper and he writes a note saying, screw 50 cent, knowing where the screw would fit to 99.50. <laughs> Next heading is don't do it. So my most frequent advice is no, I get uh, contacted by my many hopeful entrepreneurs who want to list their babies. They think that the life as a, as a listed company is going to become very, very glamorous. And it's just a well of fortune that you can actually take into your company going forward. That's not the case. Because I tell them, it's too early for you. You're a one-trick pony. It's just one project. You're not going to attract important investors by, by only that project. You're losing control over the price tag also, because you're not deciding anymore how much your company is worth. It will be the public who decides what your company is worth. You can risk to get a small trading and a volatile stock coming in, the stock price is jumping up and down, and very often it goes that way over the long term. And once you're going to raise more money to the company to do something important or even to survive, you can't raise that without a huge dilution, very painful. And you become a cheap target for investors. If you have a good technology which is attractive as such, but you fail to make a good entry in the stock market, you become a very cheap target for a competitor wanting to buy you. Because there is a price tag. And someone else is deciding, uh, deciding the price tag. And you can end up living a uh, living dead. You cut all the costs and you're trying to survive and you can't do anything. So I'm going to tell you a bit about being a listed company, the pros and the cons, because there are both sides of the coin, obviously. The positives is that the IPO process is a maturing process. You get to an extensive due diligence, you're turning all the stones, you're making sure that the company understands it's up to living by rules and regulations. I mean, the financial market is really a regulated one. And we are complementing, very often complementing also the management and the board, making sure that all the deficiencies are corrected. So through our network, I mean, we know so many people, we know so many companies, we can actually contact the right and relevant people and make them interested in the case and perhaps even to join the company. We are refining the investment case, and this is so important actually for the company to understand what they're doing and also to be able to present it in a good and attractive way to the investing community. And this we are helping uh, the companies with. We are drafting the equity story for them. And we are making the company known. I told you before that we're going around to see hundreds and hundreds of accounts as investors then all over the world. And this is an excellent chance to make the company known on a broader basis. And we, of course, we are helping the company to secure long-term investors. It's important to keep the stock trading on a stable level, that you have sensible and insightful long-term investors that also actually we sign off that the quality is good of this company. And that, in turn, will attract other investors. 
and you get access to additional money should you want to raise money for a good purpose, namely to invest in a new product, in a new product line or whatever, you have, what have you, uh, that's an excellent position to do that if you're a highly valued stock, a listed company. And you can pay in kind, of course. You can select a target company, say, would you want to join us? We will pay you with shares in our company. We will become a joint company instead. Now, there are negatives also. The IPO process is very time consuming. You have to be prepared to allocate like 50% of your management time during 9 to 12 months. And then, yet, you have to tend to your business on a daily basis at the same time. And also being in the stock market, is a, it gives you a limited free, freedom because, I mean, you have to adhere to a lot of rules. You have be, to be very mindful as where you put your feet. You can't say anything just at any time. You have to be very, very synchronized and orchestrated when you're conveying information, particularly information which is, you know, value driving. And you have to do the financial reports and roadshows on a regular basis. People are expecting that you will actually publish your quarterly reports and you will go on a roadshow to, to meet investors at that point in time. It's also good, of course, because then you get to know that you have everything in order yourself. Then again, the share price is determined with the stock, uh, by the stock market. I think if you mentioned that, that it can be external factors, it can be a pandemic, it can be something else which is actually depressing uh, the stock price. However good your own development is, it can also be the contrary. It can be a bull market and then everything goes up at the same time. And I agree with you entirely. When the money is on the table, take it. You should make a new issue of shares, for instance, to collect more money because it's, no one has died from having too much money yet. So qualifying for an IPO then, I said my most frequent answer is no. But what do I want to see then in a company wanting to uh, do a public entry? Well, either they have to have products in the market and a cash flow and a good liquidity situation, for instance. Or they should have pretty advanced clinical trials. I mean, from phase two and onwards. And not only one project, like I said before, referring to the one trick pony. Then prefer uh, preferably also commercial partnerships, as in the case of Bioarctic, where ASI and later on Biogen also joined the ship. And in the aftermarket, you had a very good news flow because you could announce that Abvi went in and bought an option to develop uh, BAN 0805 for Parkinson's disease, which was an extremely good news event. And that also gave you a lot of upfront cash, $80 million, if I remember correctly. Yeah. So the company is full of cash and it's full of good news all the time. Um, Speaking about uh, future news flow, you have also to be mindful that you have to release on a regular basis good news, but not quasi news. Don't send out meaningless news releases because that's going to dilute people's attention and people are going to get tired of you also, that you're saying nothing really. So next time you really have good news, they will, they will not look at it. Uh, structure maturity, I went through that before. I mean, that's something you try to attain also by the, by the IPO process. But that has to be commenced long before the IPO process. You have to build on your maturity in a very conscious manner, long before you ask an investment bank to lead you to the stock market. And there's evaluation. I mean, you have to be big enough to be in the stock market, to be in a good position volume-wise and trading-wise in the stock market. I think I would say that I would discourage a company worth less than, say, 200 million euros to enter the stock market, the main list at least in Sweden. And the analysts have to support the case. I mean, the equity analysts, they are independent people. They form their own, uh, their own vision of your uh, quality of the company and they should be independent because investors should with confidence be able to contact them and hear their story, what they think about the case and the company. If they're not supportive, obviously there's no, not going to be an IPO. 
What are the alternatives to the stock market? Well, I was delighted to hear the Minister of Industry and Innovation say before about the activities at the university, how they're trying to stimulate and encourage early uh, companies, early stage companies, because there really aren't so many alternatives. Universities, I mentioned here, state funds, there are state funds, but beware then with state funds because they may be very bureaucratic, like Matthias said before. Uh, also, so incubators and business angels, I prefer to call them business devils because they're not in there for just the fun of it. And then my favorite actually is actually venture capital, uh, and I concur with everything that Eugen said about venture capital, bringing not only money to the table, but also deep pockets, a long-term view, and a very set mind as how to develop com the company for the benefit of all the players inside, whether it be venture capital or the, the uh, innovators. There is non-dilutive funding, again, referring to what Matthias said, it can be very bureaucratic. And I think the, the probability of you getting uh, free money or, or yeah, gratis money in the end is very low. So, I mean, you should really think twice before you get into a, a, an application process for, for, for instance, uh, uh, European funding. You have high net worth individual and family offices also, and they are very often driven by the fact that there's someone in there, uh, s some relative who's fallen in, in that very in ill in that very indication that they're wanting to invest in. So they have no sort of scientific rationale for getting in there, but a more an emotional rationale. That's very often the case. So the summary. Uh, stock markets are meant for growing, funding growing companies, so that's what they're there for. So it could be a good idea, but think twice, don't go too early. And make sure that you're an attractive investment case, make sure that you're well prepared. Secure partnership is if, if you can, they may be dilute, dilutive in the beginning, but in the long run it's very good to have a partner who's, you know, wanting to pay money to get into the partnership up front. And that is really a token of quality and a token of commercial viability if, the, if you get a partner who's prepared to pay. Make sure that you're in an advanced clinic and or have products in the market. And this is a very important advice. There's so many banks out there also. If the investment bank, the serious investment bank says no, advises against an IPO, don't go to a bottom trawler because they will pull off an IPO for you, which is going to be detrimental, and you're going to be dead before you know it. That was a pretty sad ending, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you for a direct message. And we'll take, we will all take it to heart. Um, next up, we have Cecilia Omerstotter. Uh, she's head of pharmaceutical sciences at Albotech and professor at the Faculty of Pharmaceutical Sciences at the University of Iceland. Thank you very much, Svanhildur. And uh, dear guests, and uh, uh, special uh, Special thanks to the, the sweetest speakers that have come here to Iceland to give us this very inspiring talks about uh, one of, of the topics that are very close to my heart, which is the collaboration between the academy and, and industry. And uh, I'm very glad to have the opportunity to tell you a little bit more uh, about the status in particular here in Iceland. And, uh, uh, and uh, I would like to start uh, where we, or I would like to close this meeting where we started today and talk more about uh, how we bridge the gap between the academy and the industry. There has been a lot of this, uh, there have been a lot of, of interesting talks today, uh, and I will try to summarize that uh, focusing on Iceland and the collaboration between uh, the University of Iceland and Alvotech. Uh, in 2018, so not so long ago, uh, Alvotech and the University of Iceland signed a collaboration agreement and the purpose is to promote uh, collaboration between both parties and utilize the specialist knowledge, skills, resources and facilities. Uh, and the objectives are 
to uh, identify opportunities. We have talked a lot about opportunities here today, and mainly for the interdisciplinary collaboration, uh, focusing on teaching, research, and innovation. And we want to share the specialist knowledge and promote adv advancement of scientific research in the academic field, mainly related to Albotex activities. And since then, uh, we have had some good progress. And these are the three pillars that I mentioned earlier. And I will start, start with the teaching and training. Uh, like has been mentioned here uh, more than once today, we have with a, a group of, of very good team, both from the University of Iceland and Alvatech, established an interdisciplinary a master program in industrial biotechnology. And like the uh, rector said earlier today, and the first students graduated uh, this spring, and we have seen an increased interest in this program. Uh, furthermore, we have had several students from the Faculty of Pharmaceutical Sciences working on their research programs uh, in collaboration with Alvatech. We have had uh, joint projects and several employees from Alvatech are teaching and giving lectures at seminars at, uh, at the university. And furthermore, uh, our university also provides continuous education for our employees. Um, the newest initiative is an intern, uh, internship program for new grads. And uh, we advertised this in a collaboration with the career uh, Students and Career Council Center at the university. And we received over 100 applications. And five uh, new grads were enrolled in September this year. And the plan is, if, if everything goes according to our plans, uh, to have like five to six students starting every six months. With regards to the scientific research, we have had joint research uh, projects, and we see that there is a lot of opportunity to, to further grow this in this field. Uh, we have mainly been focusing on also building up uh, a joint infrastructure, and one of the good examples is that uh, the industrial biotechnology uh, department and associated research group will be a part of the new facility that is being built at Alvotech. So there we see a lot of opportunities for communication and collaboration between the two parties. Um, with regards to innovation, uh, we have heard a lot about good ideas coming from the academia that has then uh, been brought into to, to startups and, and even uh, then uh, collaborated with, with large pharma. Uh, I want to mention that Alvotech is committed to, to driving innovation to improve patient access. And Alvotech is relatively unique uh, in the way that we have a dedicated group headed by my colleague, Andrew Falconbridge, sitting here in, 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 the, uh, in this hall. And uh, he is heading the, the innovation within Alvotech. And uh, he and his group are focusing on finding ways uh, to make Alvotech better, faster, leaner and faster. And to see opportunities to collaborate with, with startups, uh, other companies, as well as, as uh, the university. Uh, I want to mention that uh, if we want to ensure that we have uh, innovative and progress, and we are innovative and progressive in this space, we need to, to uh, we need to collaborate and have the partnership with the university and selected partners to evaluate the technology and drive continuous improvements of process making Iceland and the Science Park a center of excellence in these activities. And what is the gain for, for the community? So if I start with the University of Iceland, uh, it's key to establish a truly up-to-date and relevant training and research program uh, in this uh, new and applied uh, and rapidly changing field. Uh, it rewards both in research output and financial opportunities for students and researchers that can be very significant. The gain for Alvatech, on the other hand, is also to, to have the, 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 the dialogue and, and the communication about new ideas and knowledge. It's also to generate and identify and recruit talent, like I mentioned here before. Uh, to establish uh, uh, good 
research collaboration with the university and other university. And I have to mention that here that we also have research uh, laboratories at other sites uh, in Europe that also have good collaborations uh, with the university, local universities there. And the cooperation and support uh, for grant applications and internship programs. And what impact does it have for Iceland, if, if we try to summarize that? The research initiatives uh, in biotechnology are the cornerstone of the building the industry. And although uh, you mentioned uh, the, the fermented shark, I don't think that was the intention at the point in time to, to establish a, a, a biotech industry in Iceland. I think it was more uh, the way to survive, but of course from, from, from the need to we get good uh, good solutions. Uh, the close proximity to academia and industry fosters the ambition and fuels innovation. And a better alignment between the academia and industry ensures better uh, alignment in development educational programs that meet the demands of the industry. And uh, to finalize this, uh, the case of growing the biotech industry in Iceland as you probably know, the technologies are increase, increasingly covering and fusing in a rapid space. Uh, pace, um, the calls for interdisciplinary approaches in education, research and innovation. And sustainable manufacturing of biomolecules requires skills in bioinformatics, in cell biology, uh, molecular genetics, biochemistry, chemical engineering, mechanical process engineering, pharmacology, quality control and management, if I mention a few. Uh, Iceland has an uh, interesting breadth in biotechnology, despite its small size. And there is an increased focused, focus on education and training and research in both the both basic and applied one in this field. And that's the key to the success. The increased collaboration between academia and industry, which benefit research, in, and all biotech companies, and that will allow them to grow domestically and help build what new ones, strengthening science-based high technology and high-value bio-industries in Iceland. And at the end, uh, I want to uh, mention and, and reflect to, to the Minister of Innovation and Industry mentioned here before, and also just to, to give a little thought about uh, the biosimilar uh, focus here. Uh, that we should remind ourselves uh, that you don't always have to be first. Google was uh, the 12th search engine. Uh, Facebook was the 10th social network. Tesla wasn't the first to introduce electric cars. So it's not always who does it first. It's who does it right at the right time with a dash of luck, like mentioned here previously. Thank you very much. framlag háskólans til atunulífs er að sæti nýja þekkingu sem á síðan nýta til að byggja upp nýjar atunugreinar eða til að þróa frekar þau gömlu. Það er grundvallar atriði að háskólar og atunulífs vinni saman. Þetta eru tvær grunnstóðir í okkar samfélagi og þær þurfa að stiga við hvor aðra. Við erum að byggja hér upp þekkinga samfélag á Íslandi og það næst ekki nema með því að við þróum saman hugmyndir sem vaksa hér í háskólum og náttúrulega hjá fyrirtækjunum og leggjumst saman á áratnar. Og það eru brýr sem við erum að byggja og það er mjög mikilvægt að það séu vegi sem liggi í báðar áttir því það mun síðan leiða sér aukna nýsköpun, aukin tækifæri og vonandi nýjan viðnað á Íslandi. Með grunnrannsóknum sem eru fróðar í háskólum koma fram marga frábæra hugmyndir. Ekki bara fyrir aðlíu heldur fyrir framfarið í samfélaginu. Við ætlum til þess af háskólanum að hann hafi innan sína vetja vísindamenn sem uppgöt nýja þekkingu og við vonast til þess að sumta þessari þekkingu sé hægt að nýta 
til að búa til alls konar vörur, til þess að hlúa að uppbygging af atvinnulífi og svo framvegis. Við þurfum að hafa velmettað fólk, við þurfum að hafa tækifæri fyrir þau, við þurfum að hafa undirstöður sem er það fjármagn líka til að geta byggt upp rannsóknir og eðina. Og það eru svo margar hugmyndir sem það verið notaðar í atvinnulífinu sem bara spretta upp sem grunnrannsóknir í háskólum. Og við sjáum þetta svo sterkt núna þegar að kemur svona krísa eins og heimsfarandrinni. Þá getum við ekki nógsamlega að þakka fyrir það menntakerfi og háskólisamfélag og þá innviði sem að fæða af sér okkar besta vísindafólk sem að getur leitt og grá fram. Háskólinn má ekki eingungu verið að vinna við að búið til hægnýta þettingu. Það verður líka að búið til þess að grunda allar þettingu sem allt byggist á, stílningur okkur á umheinum og stílingurinn á okkur sjálfum. Mjög gott hérna á video, við skulum samt ekki að horfa það aftur. Sorry, I just said this was a really good video, but let's not watch it again. But here with us we have Cecilia, which just gave her talk. Inga Þórsdóttur, Dean of School of Health Sciences, University of Iceland, welcome. And Sigríður Valgirsdóttir, she is Senior Advisor on Innovation and former member of Rose Diagnostics Operations Leadership Team. I had senior advisor on innovation in the Ministry of Innovation. Um, if we start, start with you, Sigríður, um, because we heard Cecilia now just tell us about uh, the collaboration between Albotech and, and the University of Iceland. Um, you have, in your past, because you have sort of been, you know, at every side of the table. Um, you used to work for Ross, and can you maybe tell us a little bit about uh, uh, your time there and the uh, liaisons with universities that Ross had? Uh, yes, uh, yeah, thank you. And, and I want to start with thank you. With Thanks for the excellent seminars here today, and, and this was inspiring. And <clears throat> maybe uh, because I myself studied in Sweden, I did my PhD in Uppsala in, in molecular biology, and um, at that time, if I before go, coming to Rose, at that time we were this was a, it was in the in the nineties, for uh, talet as you say in Sweden, and uh, that was a very exciting time in biochemistry and molecular biology. A lot of uh, growth factors and growth factor receptors were to be identified. New proteins in signal transduction, where we were always asking this big question: what change? What makes the difference between a normal cell and a cancer cell. But even though it's an exciting time, it also took a long time. It, was, it required so much patience and all of us, the students, not only in the lab in Uppsala, but around the world, I'm sure, we were always asking ourselves, is this of any use to do this? And am I ever going to find out anything out of these studies? And that's the typical thing because research requires a lot of patience and time and you're always struggling with, with data. But then 20 years later, back in, in Germany, when I was working for Rose, uh, both uh, diagnostic in production uh, and uh, pharma production, we were actually producing products and, and drugs, cancer, uh, products and, and cancer chemical, uh, cancer drugs, yes, uh, that were based on the studies in the 90s. Uh, we were producing uh, antibodies against these receptors and, and the growth factors. So that was inspiring for me to see that those studies back in the 90s, uh, not only in Uppsala, not only in Sweden, but worldwide, actually had led to something led to the production of biochemical uh, drugs and products that really changed the uh, life of so many people. So that's one way of seeing the, the, the connection between academia and industry. After, uh, even though sometimes there is a long time between, uh, be between uh, uh, research and then the actual production, there is a goal with the whole, all of it. Um, Inka, if we maybe turn to you, uh, is this something that you can relate to uh, or maybe through your students? Is this, is this uh, a thought that occurs to every student, you know, 
during the course of the studies that is anything that I'm doing now going to be of any use to anyone? Yes, I, 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 I think so, actually. In, in our School of Health Sciences, um, we have uh, six faculties. So, and uh, what we are doing uh, now uh, more than before, I have to say, is interdisciplinary work. So I so totally agree with you who have mentioned that, that new things, innovation, new ideas and development uh, very much come from the inter interdisciplinary collaboration. We established um, a health science institute, which should be uh, a research and innovation institute just two years ago. And uh, uh, we have very compact education. <laughs> so we do not have so much of a choice in courses as we have in many of the other schools at the university, the four other schools, as we have a uh, faculty of odontology and they have very compact education, as you know, they also have in Sweden and the faculty of medicine and the medical students have very compact education and they focus on themselves and their subjects and that's the same for faculty of nurses uh, faculty of psychology even and uh, food science and nutrition and uh, of course uh, pharmaceutical sciences uh, these subjects of today are so uh, loaded. They are loaded with uh, new knowledge, new basic courses, and very important applications. Because all of our students, they graduate with, uh, uh, you know, a degree. They, so uh, the degree is a key for work all around the world. Uh, so, so there is a challenge. We know and understand it's important, but it's a challenge to uh, work and teach uh, interdisciplinary subjects. So we have been able to squeeze into small courses in the basic studies for all these subjects. And, uh, um, uh, but, but it's difficult. And then we have this... Um, the studies in master and PhD uh, and diplomas where we have, have much more uh, possibilities. So squeeze in this, uh, try to broaden up and open up uh, the minds to work together with other kind of, of uh, specialities. But I think in, in the... Uh, in the uh, research uh, education in the further studies in master and in PhD. I also did my PhD in, in Sweden. Someone here is from Gothenburg, <laughs> I heard. <laughs> and there, I did my uh, doctor of medical sciences at that time, and it was even earlier than in the 90s. Um, so so uh, I, I think we always have, when we are doing our uh, research for master or for a PhD, we, are, we have to be very focused. And that's also very, very useful to have learned that. Uh, also, when you come to companies later on, or you come to industry, or you come to applied science, you come to administration, and, and so on. May I comment? Yeah, absolutely. This is very a very, very important subject. Yeah. And uh, in the Anglo-Saxon educational system, yeah. the students very early on have to study a little human yoga, they have to study basic mathematics, they have to take a little natural science. And so they get a very early training mm -hmm. in, in actually mixing different. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, what, what we are looking for is, is much deeper, much, mm -hmm. uh, much heavier, I think. In, in Sweden, we have the same system as uh, here in Iceland, which yes. is that we are very specialized in our education yes. focus. Uh, and th there's one, uh, one effort to try to bridge. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's a private effort. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called the Stockholm School of Entrepreneurship. Yes. It's a collaboration I know. of yeah. medical school, of uh, mm -hmm. 
uh, Institute of Technology, mm -hmm. the Business School, and the, so the students from the different schools mm -hmm. are offered the opportunity mm -hmm. to go and have courses mm -hmm. in each other's school. Mm -hmm. This is more on the master's level and mm -hmm. also mm -hmm. uh -huh. yeah. mm -hmm. Yes. I think this is a very good example that we have to try more here. We have mm. several interdisciplinary lines at our school and together, of, of course, with other schools at the uni university. And I think this is very important. Mm. What we have, uh, especially at the, the School of Health Sciences, are all these contracts. So we practically have a contract with each healthcare service in the country. So I'm very busy with always checking the contracts and checking the deadlines. <laughs> and, and a lot of my staff are, are there too. And we have many with the National University Hospital. Because there we have set a lot of uh, smaller research units. And I, in a way, I think this is very good. And it should be stimulated much more uh, the innovation part of this. Uh, and oh, I think the way here is actually more stuff. Sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. Because my professors are loaded. They are loaded both with uh, clinical work, uh, some administration, some teaching, uh, guidance in, in, in master and PhD studies, but this is just the way for health sciences. It is a quite loaded science, but uh, it's also very loaded with opportunities. Very, very much so. And uh, therefore we have, and we, we feel that we have very important contracts with us. Alvotech, some other innovation, uh, even small companies where our professors have been. The, uh, the entrepreneurs and the innovation guys. And, uh, so, and I think that's uh, very important for the students. Mm -hmm. So they can have their education within uh, private companies or companies that are collaborating with the university or not. We have, uh, so we have contracts with uh, the code and Alvotech and with MATIS, the Food Science Institute. Uh, so, so uh, we, we are really trying to push our students also in this uh, way of, of opportunities and, and new ideas and new work. But the uh, thing is the loaded schedule. The loaded schedule. I, I would maybe like to expand a little bit on this and with the help from the, the auditorium. Uh, maybe Professor Ullian? Uh, is this the? Do you have the same experience, you know, in, in Sweden with uh, that uh, the bureaucratic load and the administration is taking so much time from the, you know, maybe the the work you would like to focus and on the curriculum. I mean, the curriculum. There's not so much room. In there. I, I think it is. It's a very interesting uh, topic because I do think there is more bureaucracy in. Both in the university setting, but also in society in general. Mm -hmm. So, this is a problem, of course. But at the same time, we need to have control and all of this. Also. I think mm -hmm. it's, it's very hard to fight. I think it's important for the management of universities to try to keep the bureaucracy to a minimum. Mm -hmm. The minimum is quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I agree. You agree with that, Lars? I agree. <laughs> Lars, mm. you agree with that? Uh, my comment would be that the bureaucracy is not just in the university, it is also in the companies, mm. especially because we have made an IQ. And now we have very skilled uh, in the Seneca, we use one of the smaller groups, and I used to say that. I'm much better to you know how to break groups. I have not <laughs> seen the <laughs> Thank you. Yes. So, Celia, um, so Celia, um, um, uh, no, you are now with Alvotech, but you joined Alvotech after years in the academy. In the academy. Um, was there anything that surprised you uh, during this transition? Is that 
Is there anything that comes to mind? And, and also, um, what learners can academia take from the business environment? Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of surprises, of course, uh, being in the academia. Of course, you have a research group, but you do most of the things yourself and you do it your way. And then you, when you start working for a company, there is, of course, more resources, uh, better infrastructure uh, in, in many cases but also that you have a team around you that can support you and, and do things. And, and uh, so I think that was maybe the, the, the surprise to begin with. Uh, what the academia can take from the industry is, is, is maybe uh, sometimes, I know it is changing a lot, mainly with the new generation, but a little bit more openness on, on the applications of the mm. work that they are mm. doing. Mm. looking at the opportunities and so not just counting the, the papers and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and trying to get research grants mm -hmm. to do the research. Of course, that's an important part to do basic research, mm -hmm. but also sometimes look for opportunity because I think there's a lot of, of seeds that uh, mm -hmm. never get the opportunity to become mm -hmm. uh, flowers. So in, in, in that field, I think uh, that is something that, of course, you need to have sometimes someone to support you that looks for the seed. You need to have accelerator, incubators, people that are interested also to take this further. So sometimes it's not the professors or the scientists themselves mm -hmm. that have the, the core interest in that. So I think this is something that uh, might be learned. Mm -hmm. And you told me this morning, you, you had this little story of you not being a light bulb. Yeah. <laughs> Can you tell us about that? Yeah. <laughs> That's probably one of the reasons uh, why, why I, I entered the dark side, like some, some people say, but uh, I don't fully agree with that. But uh, after being a professor uh, and, and uh, lately the dean of the faculty of pharmaceutical sciences, I saw that maybe my strength and my skills and interest are more on the, like you mentioned, and I haven't seen it before, uh, on the development side rather than the innovation side. I'm not the person that gets 100 ideas a day. I am more... And that's a good to have a colleague like Andrew that gets all the ideas. Mm -hmm. I'm much better on taking the ideas, bringing them into project plan and execute them. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one, one of the, the reasons. <laughs> we are talking about here how academia... Did Thank you, Professor <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about how academia and industry can create value together. And, and to me, after having listened to all of you today here, uh, from, the, you know, from the science side to the investment banker, um, it seems like a win-win situation. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I remember having listened to you, Cecily, at a, at a, at a conference uh, about a year ago when you said, which was quite mind-blowing, that the biotech industry could maybe be one of the largest pillars of the economy in five years' time, or maybe less, mm -hmm. producing or exporting uh, almost as much as our fishes. And um, then I'm just... Kind of wondering, maybe you could answer that, Sira, because you have been a part of making the new uh, innovation policy. Are there any obstacles for us uh, uh, to, to create more partnership between you know, the academia and, and, and businesses? Uh, obstacles? No, I mean, academia and uh, industries should not... I mean, they are also independent. And uh, something that Kauri Stephens also said, uh, it's important that academia also has their own studies and something that are not necessarily meant for business and vice versa. But uh, that they are supporting each other is the most important and working together where it, where it uh, fits. And uh, maybe the, uh, it's a question of, uh, of, of the mind, you know, the, uh, sometimes mm -hmm. I think of both from both sides, from academia side, mm -hmm. you think it's, yeah, are you going go into industry? Why? You know, and, and also <laughs> from industry, there's a lack of uh, understanding mm -hmm. of, of how the way things are going in, within academia. Mm -hmm. But if we manage to, to bridge that, we can, we can just continue to work together. And I think this is changing a lot now uh, that we are doing more and more in, in, in bridging between academia and industries, like, like yes. you both are ex describing. Yes. I think uh, we have these very impressive examples from, from Sweden, and we can learn a lot from Sweden, uh, that uh, 
we of course are used to talk about ourselves as a small country. We are a small country uh, in Iceland. Sometimes mm -hmm. I hear even our friends in Sweden talk about Sweden as a small country, which is maybe surprising to us, but I think you do sometime. And to see how a small country in the north, how much they can accomplish mm -hmm. by setting or putting mm -hmm. effort and focusing on mm -hmm. biotech and, and uh, industry based mm -hmm. on knowledge, mm -hmm. yeah, that is so impressive and so inspiring for us. So that is the way to go. Okay. I, I don't think there are so many obstacles to this uh, if we just want decide that this is what mm -hmm. we want to do. Okay. Yes, this may be correct. Uh, there are not many obstacles, but and uh, especially I think there is a bright future for the pharmaceutical sciences. I think there, uh, the opportunities here are extremely large. And the education is, is uh, heavy in science, but also opening up very much for, uh, for the industry. So I think we have uh, a great or very obvious op opportunities there. We also have in uh, IT innovation, mm -hmm. as for example, we have contract with the Heart Association who have developed IT or, or programs for the healthcare centers to facilitate uh, problems with, with heart disease and, and so on. So, so there is a lot of uh, both small and larger issues going on. Mm. Do you think that uh, the say. university can maybe market the opportunities more? Uh, announce them, you mean mean talk about them? Yes, uh, yeah, talk yeah. more about successful collaborations that you've had in several of... Yes, uh, I, I would not uh, like to <laughs> criticize what has been uh, cast the light on already, but of course, of course. Stuff, Svanit. <laughs> <laughs> stuff. Yes, I, I've taken that note down. Uh, needs more stuff. Um, should you talk a little bit about the science part? It's a, you know, it's a, yes, it, it's a great project, and we are now yes. eight to nine years, you know, yes. into the official foundation of the of the of the university science park. Yes. Um, very that, young, still very young, actually, but but. Yes. Yeah. But. Um, how satisfied are you with how it has evolved? And, and mm -hmm. what difference does it make to have this established in this close proximity to the university? Mm. I, I, but it, it, it is really important. I would, I would say so. Um, I would also like more <laughs> companies stuff. and <laughs> stuff <laughs> and more companies to know to, to build there, actually. Uh, I think. Uh, that would be very, uh, for example, the Food Science Institute should be here at the university park, at the science park. And uh, so, so I think uh, we have a lot of opportunities still there. That, that's obvious. So we were talking to the minister during the break uh, exactly about this, about the science park and what could be made to maybe um, fuel it even more. Mm. Um, where do you see the opportunities? What can the authorities do, for instance? Yeah. If you talk, talk as a, <laughs> from that branch. Yeah, yeah we, we absolutely see the science park and this center here uh, between the two universities and in proximity with the, to the uh, companies <coughs> as a big opportunity. And, and that's also the, what the uh, ministry is willing to support further. And uh, not only in different areas, um, so that uh, there is an opportunity for startup companies in, in the field, for example, in biotech or in high tech, to uh, have the opportunity to, uh, to have space and, and, uh, and support to build up further. And there we are, for example, talking about the uh, common use of equipment, because uh, equipment and... Uh, the uh, for for the um, yeah for this type of science and and development is sometimes very expensive so we have to make sure that we are using our equipment and expensive uh, computers i should say in a in a wise way 
And that's uh, something that we are working on together with the university mm -hmm. and both universities mm -hmm. on how to support the uh, combined use of, of, of our facilities and equipment. And also how to use, it's very much about the human resources, how can we stimulate that uh, our best scientists, mm -hmm. our uh, entrepreneurs, can actually meet, you know, gather together. And we need, this is something we need more people, don't we? We need more people, absolutely. Yes. And, and, and that's something that we have also been looking for. How can we make Iceland more attractive for, for uh, scientists, uh, entrepreneurs and, and business people who would like to come and, 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 and stay with us either for, for a short or long uh, period? And I think this has been very important for, for Alvo Tech, for example, and for other, uh, high-tech uh, companies here in Iceland that we simply, even though we are very smart here in Iceland and well-educated, as we think, we sometimes simply don't have the people to fill in some of the positions. I think this is correct. Mm -hmm. Inga? Mm -hmm. I, think, yeah, I think it's just time yeah. to add to this. Mm -hmm. I'm on the board of the Science Park of the Terminsky Institute, and, and I find, I have to argue this mm -hmm. all the time with, with the management and, and the other board members. I think there's a focus, uh, and I love that, mm -hmm. uh, there's a focus on the companies and creating new products and, and so on. But uh, a country, uh, that one of the biggest mm -hmm. costs in a country is the healthcare system. There's so much innovation going on in the practical work, in the hospitals mm -hmm. and so on. I think it's very important to understand mm -hmm. that uh, this type of resource should not only work with companies and products. And yeah. That is fun and it's easy mm. to count. Yeah. We have one company, two companies, three companies. But uh, we have to <coughs> utilize all the day-to-day -day innovation that is going on in the healthcare system because that will save much, much more money and, and create more value for the country, I think, in the short term than, mm. uh, than hoping that there will be another big company like Apple Tech or or uh, oh. that would take much more oh. time. Oh. May I add to this? Yes. Because this is, uh, I totally agree with you, and this is something that we have been looking very much into, uh, how to stimulate uh, the innovation and, and research and development within the institutes, like and within the, it. yeah, to recognize, and also, but it's also about the time and space to, to uh, implement these uh, changes, uh, both to, f to develop and, 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 and also then to in implement uh, innovative solutions. So I totally agree. This is not only about the co companies uh, or, and absolutely not only about the startups. It's about the uh, innovation uh, everywhere and, and the, what happens within the institutes, for example, within the hospitals. It's absolutely important, and, and this has been a big topic in the discussion here in, in Iceland because, uh, yeah, the hospitals are under so much pressure now during COVID and all this, but at the same time, there are so many solutions in the head uh, and so much, much experience and so much knowledge among the people that we need to develop and, and uh, utilize further. So, yeah. Maybe in, in the meeting between, yeah. for example, the digital education system and, and the medical. Absolutely. So, uh, there are new ways to do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and how to stimulate the, uh, yeah, the more digital solutions, that's a, that's a topic in itself. Mm -hmm. I'm really sorry to have to bring this to a close, but uh, maybe to finish up, Cecilia, uh, the key takeaways from today, from our great speakers, mm -hmm. what did you say we take away <coughs> from the day? So I think, uh, and uh, to, to make this uh, work very well, I think it's all about first communication, having the dialogue, having a forum to discuss the opportunities, uh, the newest scientific research and, and how we can work together. So I think that's the first part, it's, it's a communication. And then it can follow by coordination, how we're gonna do it and hopefully ends up in a very successful collaboration. Thank you. Thank you all, Cecilia, Inka, and Sigrid for taking part in the panel. And I would also like to thank all of our wonderful speakers for a very interesting afternoon. Um, the organizers, of course, the University of Iceland, Alvotec, Arctic, and Swedish Icelandic Chamber of Commerce for making this conference possible. Um, 
I would like to remind you of that uh, there are drinks waiting at uh, Alvatec headquarters. I hope you all take part there. So thank you very much for this uh, conference and this, uh, this excellent and interesting day. It's been a pleasure for me. Thank you.